us being the only fertilizer plant that can do wet blend, we are the ones permitted to do it and take it to the north. So these are some of the unique things. Um, like I said, over the last six, seven years, we have enjoyed a unique opportunity to sell fertilizer from Edo to the rest of the country, and in particular to the northeast. We have also been able to key into the presidential fertilizer initiative. It is actually by virtue of that, that today Edo Fertilizer is the president of the Fertilizer Producers and Suppliers Association of Nigeria, for which I am uh, <laughs> privileged to be the president today. I think I owe that to uh, the state government for supporting us and giving us that opportunity. That's it. Thank you so much, Sadiq. So the final speaker for this initial round will be Mr. Tagbozo. He's a group executive projects, Sara Africa International. Tagbo, three minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, all protocols are there. Um, so yes. And the group executive project, I'm currently the person or the one building the Green Hills ethanol plant, which has, uh, has been much talked about. Um, was visited yesterday by the governor along with uh, the commissioner of the road, uh, uh, the plant. Um, Green Hills ethanol plant, we call it ENA, extra alcohol, is actually a joint venture between two companies, South Africa International and uh, the Mohinani Group. All right, these two companies came together to um, set up this green yield. Um, the opportunities for this, of course, became obvious after this company or these investors sought for um, land to be able to cultivate the feedstock in the south, uh, in southwest area of the country, a couple of states, and ultimately settled for a do state, one of the best opportunities in terms of um, um, its agricultural um, focus program, and uh, of course the rains, very supportive of cassava. Cassava is the feedstock used for uh, this ENA, and um, ultimately we settled here. The, we mentioned the program which is very encouraging. Um, the do state enabled us easily acquire the relevant access to land, uh, along with the um, service of incorporation, oh, sorry, CFOs for, for those lands. And the project started. Since about 2020, the, the Green Hills has been farming cassava between Olubo and um, Ewesi. Uh, in Olubo, uh, the, the business has about um, 2,000 hectares of land, with about uh, just about half of that as uh, cultivable, already uh, farmed with cassava for, since about 2020. We also have access to land um, in Ewesi through our sister company, Saro Oil Palm where we are, they have about 25,000 hectares of land there. So in totality right now, the Green Hills project has about 5,600 hectares of uh, land cultivated with cassava. Now, this project is designed to produce ENA, like I said, with cassava as a feedstock. Um, alongside, it also produces carbon dioxide. We all know ENA is ethanol. The drink, we all drink, we all know uh, the, the uses of this drink. It can also be used for fuels in some climes. Um, ethanol in particular in, in this country right now is at about 400 million liters per annum, of which about not less than 80% of this, 80 to 85% of this is imported. So the economic relevance or significance of this product is very, is very obvious. The amount of foreign exchange we are losing to importing this. The huge opportunity therefore to produce this and substitute um, imports in Nigeria. So this plant will produce ethanol, will also produce other spirits used uh, for the perfumeries, uh, pharmaceutical industries, and cleaning, and so on and so forth, as well as CO2. CO2 is the, the gas used by the beverage manufacturers in the Cokes and the Sprites and so on and so forth. So that's also a very commercially relevant product. Um, the project is also designed to be very sustainable. Socially, you can talk about that subsequently. Socially, economically and um, environmentally. Um, alongside, it has one of the most unique, the best um, effluent treatment system found in any uh, ethanol plant currently in Nigeria. All right? It produces natural gas likewise, and this plant should be able to subsidize its intake 
on consumption of natural gas by at least 20%. The plant runs on natural gas itself, and about 20% will produce internally, which of course makes this a much more green project and a much more environmentally uh, friendly uh, project. So that is it in a nutshell, and um, we thank the governor, we thank the government of Edo State for this opportunity to be here, and uh, we expect to be able to talk about this more in the program. Thank you so much, Tago. Thank you. So I'll ask a couple more questions, and then we'll go to the audience. I'd like to kick off with Sadiq. You know, um, and, and probably speak to the mindset of an investor who is asking himself, do I trust the state government? Do I trust enough to put my money here? PPPs have been notorious in Nigeria in terms of government defaults. And here you were, you took up an asset, a latent or at least a suboptimal asset. I'm not you know, sure of the state that the asset was in. What kind of thinking did your company go through in order to make this decision, you know, to invest. Thank you very much. I think the first issue here is that of trust. Is that of trust uh, for the people behind the government. I say this without any fear of contradiction. The governor is a man who has built his reputation on that. So we could take that to the bank in the first instance. The second is the fact that um, as a private sector organization, what we are really very keen about is setting the record straight, putting all the necessary checks. Yes, we know, for instance, every cycle of election or government would be a maximum of eight years. So you need to have all the checks set out within that time frame so that both of you would have put together, um, let's say, milestones to be achieved, um, uh, maybe targets that need to be uh, done. And then, for instance, for me, uh, we felt that we do not want to take over the state asset as it is at that time, because it would send the wrong signals, even for the governor himself. So the first thing is, can we operate it and run it profitably to contribute and then showcase it for others to see? Then afterwards, we'll get to that next level. Um, part of the standing agreement we've had is already uh, taken care of by all the legal uh, things that have been uh, put in place, where the investments we have done are covered and protected, the state government acknowledges that. And because we are keen into a federal government uh, initiative, uh, there is also the uh, look at what would be our contribution to the state and to the nation. This is very important and is critical. We have done a little bit. Uh, like I said, the Presidential Fertilizer Initiative has delivered its, uh, has delivered its uh, mandate over the last seven years because if I look at it over the last seven years over 70 to 80 million bags of fertilizer have been produced and pushed into the Nigerian, uh, farming, system, into the Nigerian farming system and that's a commendable uh, effort I mean there is nowhere you can say 80 million I mean, 80 million bags of fertilizer have been pushed out. This is a definite thing. And this does not include uh, the production made by Indorama, by Notori, or Dangote, who have started, who, who are producing the um, other uh, fertilizer blends uh, or production, the urea production. Uh, the three of them have a capacity to produce up to 7 million tons of fertilizer and that means Nigeria is actually self-sufficient as far as urea is concerned. We have produced up to 80 million bags of uh, NPK blends to meet the requirement of the farming population. And believe it or not, the capacity of uh, blenders in Nigeria is over 8 million tons. So we are only constrained today by the remaining uh, 30 
37% to 40% of imported raw material that we would need to produce to serve Africa. Thank you so much. So you trusted and then the paperwork followed. Well, the first yes. thing was you trusted. Thank you. Kazim, I'd like to come to you uh, now. Um, IHS, you've talked about Edo State and you used the word when you and I spoke three days ago. You said by far the most connected state in the country. Um, how has this affected the lifestyles and the livelihoods of the people based on anecdotes or things you know in the communities where you've served? Yes, thank you. Um, and I, I, I maintain my by far. Uh, we have done about 10,500 kilometers nationwide in three years. If Edo accounts for 1,003 of it, I think that's, that, that's humongous. Uh, and that's not even counting what the state has done. So in terms of connectivity per capita, this state is maybe three times better than the next best state uh, close to it. And, and, and that's a big deal. Now, just in terms of what technology brings, I think by and large, it provides an opportunity for the states to unlock access to digital services, digital infrastructure, entrepreneurship, innovation, to keep the young people of the states busy. Um, this is 60, 70, 80 percent of the states is youthful. Uh, we're planning to work with the states to build innovation models where young people can bring new ideas, uh, create companies, create uh, businesses, look at new technologies, AI, um, digital infrastructure, enabling um, ideas can come out of the states. Now, that's looking at it from a pure enterprise solution standpoint. When you look at governance alone, the opportunity that connectivity and the infrastructure brings to efficiency in running government services, inclusiveness, because then you have more people that are connected to government services, in fact, that are connected to government as an institution across the state. Uh, the change in lifestyle and quality of life that e-services would bring, if you start to bring electronic health system, which is also something that we started to talk to the states about in terms of innovation. So it's, it's uh, I mean, what we are providing is future-proof infrastructure opportunity for the state to leapfrog uh, and catch up, not with any state in Nigeria because it's far ahead of them now in terms of infrastructure, but to start to catch up with more developed markets where access to digital infrastructure and services is changing the way people do things and the way of life of people. That's what we're doing. Thank you so much. I mean, um, there's a lady who is part of, you know, the organization for this conference and she was speaking to me two, two days ago about the e-government. And one of her comments is, oh, I signed documents from home. And I think that that's a testament to the work, you know, you've done. Thank you. I'll come to Uncle Mike. Um, I, is anybody from Ologbo here? Any of the Royal Highnesses? Because if they are, I think they deserve a round of applause. Um, and again, it speaks to the fact that the communities have to cooperate with the government here. Because if they do, I think these goods, social, public goods, will you know, come running to them. So I'd like Uncle Mike to speak to us about why you chose Ologbo. Were, you know, were there any competitive advantages? And what has your partnership with the community been like so far? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, basically, um, OML111 is located in Ulubo, uh, which is one of the producing pits of LNPC. So when, we, so when our technical partners survey the, the whole area of Edosta, we find out that Ulubo area was unique simply because the pipeline moving crude from the, from, um, the feed uh, to the Forcados terminal uh, passes through uh, Ulubu, and we choose a location there which was uh, very, very close to the pipeline. However, when we started construction, we find out that that particular crude, uh, because as you know, 
A refinery is designed to meet specific crude um, uh, that is being produced in that area. So we, we designed the refinery to use uh, uh, Forcados plant, and I think Forcados and um, Escravos plant, and that pipeline from NPDC ends up in Forcados. But as we begin to start the construction, and we begin to uh, set up our lab, we find out that basically that particular crude was not really crude, it was condensed. But that did not deter us and because we started in 1,000 barrels a day, which was basically, as the governor said, let us have a proof of concept. So to, to do the first line of uh, products, which is basically NAFTA, uh, diesel, uh, kerosene, and uh, what is called LPFO, which is heavy oil used by the industries. So we realized that um, the crude coming from uh, OML 111 basically will give us a high percentage of NAFTA, more than 60%, and that will not make the business profitable. So we, de we decided to uh, source crude uh, from the other side, uh, from the other areas where we have crude. So those are, those are the basic challenges. But however, because of um, the uniqueness of Olobo, uh, because we've done a survey and we've had, uh, 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 we, we find out that Olobo community was quite comfortable. And when we did our logistics, but refinery is all, profitable, being profitable in refinery is all about getting your logistics right. So we were able to source crude from the neighboring locations that uh, via trucking for us to be able to, uh, uh, to start production. So basically, we are able to get crude from other, sources, uh, from other areas, which we refine uh, into three products of NAFTA, uh, diesel, and, um, and uh, uh, LPFO. But the interesting thing about the crude in Edo State is that as we graduate uh, to do petrol, once we make further investment to do petrol, is actually the best quality for any refinery that wants to do petrol. Uh, because of... So we, we are currently discussing with our technical partners right now in um, putting a, a, a financing package in place for us to increase uh, uh, a do refinery from this present capacity of 1,000 and take advantage of the crude, which is just 100 meter from the current uh, refinery for us to be able to do crude. So it would be very profitable for us because, because the, uh, the pipeline is just 100 meters for a way. It makes the logistics of sourcing crude uh, very, very easy. So we are looking at that right now. Thank you, and the community have been supportive. Yeah, actually, the, you know, the com community have been extremely supportive. And I would also like to mention here, during COVID, during, during COVID, when the country was locked down, the community actually created, created a security network for us. We didn't have to get uh, security from outside. They ensured that they interacted with us and encouraged us to do whatever we want to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to go to Tagbo for, again, the final question in this round. Um, I'm an Edo woman, and we don't joke with our Eba and our starch. So when you told me that you were taking cassava, I thought, oh, how will, they, how will this affect the average Edo household? And I, I, and I, but I'd like you to explain, you know, is this in any way going to displace any element of the value chain in terms of cassava production that local households receive? And um, even if your answer to that is no displacement, I also want you to talk about the opportunity for off-takers ultimately. In other words, how can your factory enhance the entire stock output of cassava you know, in, this, in this area? Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, if, you, if you don't mind, let me just step in here. There's a lot of noise from the back. I will appreciate that the protocol people please help us deal with that. If the security and protocol people could please address that so that our panelists can be heard. Thank you. Please go. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, in response to the question, I'd say no, we are not displacing um, uh, other users and consumers of cassava products. Yes, this plant from outset is expected to consume input um, about 400 tons per day of cassava, every day from the, from the outset. So that's a lot of cassava. But what we have done is to ensure that the bulk of this cassava from the beginning, we plan for it through providing this feedstock ourselves, through farming this feedstock ourselves, okay? The, the project also includes a program to allow the existence of outgrowers, third parties that can also contribute to the cassava um, farming and production to support the, the input. So um, at, at the moment, possibly at the beginning, the, the project will be near self-sufficient. And uh, therefore, to move to the second aspect of your question, uh, how we're going to support uh, other value chain um, partners or even players. The uh, state government clearly has an agribusiness uh, focus and direction. And of course, um, the farming is a huge opportunity here. Uh, with the arable land available, a lot of uh, investors, a lot of small players can key in and produce cassava. This plant is looking to expand immediately. Shortly after said, it's going to look to expand expansion. Uh, from the beginning, um, we expect to be outputting at least, I don't know, I won't put exact figures, but in the double. of liters of ethanol from the beginning. Okay, subsequently, it will be expected to produce even more. The cassava requirement is expected to, of course, increase, and we may not be able to continue to produce this alone. We will rely on uh, third parties or small players, medium, uh, micro uh, farmers to be able to produce and support this input of cassava. And so that's the one area in which, of course, clearly we're not displacing, rather we'll support the growth of such uh, farmers uh, to be able to uh, provide uh, li uh, livelihood to um, other investors in the value chain. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. I'd like to pause at this time so we can hear from you know, members of the, the, the plenary. Um, do you have any questions for any of our panelists? Yes, there is a question here. So we'll take a few questions and then we'll round up. Please, Mr. Yes. yes. Very respectfully, Your is here seated. Kindly permit me to proceed on the already established protocol and also to extend my greetings to the revered monarch. How about talk by Sir, Sir, thinking out of the box, jurisprudentially, you, all these wonderful presentations, in the event of carrying out the dream or, or the furtherance of this, your ideologies, I think roads is of great essence. You are aware from authorities that the governor has on several occasions attempted to fix and ameliorate the dirty nature of federal roads, but his efforts were frustrated by some persons who have negative intentions, politically Is motivated. this a question? I'm coming to a question. I'm, coming, I'm going to a question. What efforts have you done, or don't you think it would be right for you to, as private persons, non-partisan, help facilitate and align or liaise with the federal government to fix these roads since the governor is being frustrated because of political motivation? That's my humble question. Thank you so much. Um, let's take more questions. I'll come to you, Sarah and Tagbo, um, for that. Sarah Africa and Tagbo for that. Any other questions? Okay, we have a question from the gentleman to the right of the hall at the back, please. 
There's someone there with a question, please. Uh, this, okay. this is uh, engineer Akemukwe Lukman, the publisher of the bullet of the harmless rabbits. Okay. I'm a chemical engineer and I listened very carefully to the Saro Farms person. And I was there yesterday and I was really, really amazed. Now, what, I, what came to my mind is in producing this ethanol from cassava, I suspect that the water that is extracted out of it is what is used. The question that came to my mind is in our local production of Gary, we usually extract this water out of the cassava are fried the breast. Then I looked at two opportunities. After extracting the water for the processing of ethanol, what do you do with the chaff? Can it be processed into gari? Then the second opportunity I'm looking at is if somebody sets up a system where you buy all this liquid that our women usually take out of cassava and send away and bring it to you, is it useful? Can, we, can you buy it so that we can use it to empower our women? These are the two questions I'm asking. Excellent, excellent questions. Thank you. So we'll take a third question. We'll take a third question. And probably one more after that. Thank you. Um, I just want to pick it back off a question the moderator asked. And as an inv investor, as an entrepreneur, one of the biggest questions the investor community asked me from Boston is how do you trust the government? We have here a great, amazing governor that is very forward thinking, um, that has a great vision. But one of the questions, one of the worries as you sign agreement and something the same the moderator asked, one of the um, one of the biggest worry as you sign agreements with the current government is the new government comes in, there's an opportunity to kind of try to either interfere with that agreement. Um, I know there's, a, there's an agreement that was signed with- If you could please the ask the question. Yes, I, I'm, I'm asking the question. So the real question is how do you convince your board? How, when you sit in a board meeting, how do you convince your board and the investor community that yes, this agreement that you have will is sustainable for the long term so that's the first question how do you do that that's the question i get we are currently right now built we've just built the largest solar farm in the Dill state and in the next two years we'll be building the largest microgrid in the country so that's the question i get from the fellow investors how do you trust this agreement and then the second question is as a corporation what are you guys doing as a social responsibility that you're giving back to the community Excellent questions, thank you. One more. Anybody else? A head of service, please, yes. Okay, thanks, thank you. Your Excellencies, all of the protocols duly observed. Just to add to the comment regarding what the deployment of fiber optics has done its impact on a uh, dusted people. Um, I, I was just going to add that today, um, a dusted government, the governance in a dusted has moved completely from paper to paperless. And that is because of the deployment of fiber optics, the deployment of uh, broadband that a dusty government has invested in. And that's why today, every single state um, worker uh, can leave the confines of his workplace environment and be able to work. Yeah. Whether he goes away from here, or even go abroad, he can work. And so he's no longer limited by space in terms of being able to render services to the people. I thought we should mention that. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. So I think we will stop now with the question so we have enough time to respond and make our closing remarks. So I'll ask um, Sadiq to please handle the question on roads because I know that South Africa um, 
I think you had your way of dealing with that, um, the road issue in some ways, if I recall yesterday. And then I'm going to ask that, obviously, Tabo, you handle the question on the waste from the ethanol and what we can use it for. In terms of sustainability, Uncle Mike, please take that. How do you convince a board to invest in a state where the CEO tends to leave after so many uh, you know, years? And Kazim, CSR, I know IHS is you know, pretty strong on CSR. I'd like you to handle that. So please, if Sadiq could please take her. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, what role uh, do I play as a private sector No, no, operator? he said that roads are a huge challenge to development in the state, and that the state government has tried, you know, uh, so, pretty hard. So, so what are yes. we doing as a private sector operator uh, to overcome that challenge? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, we, I think... Every one of us uh, as private sector always comes with this mindset that there are challenges in the Nigerian economy and you key into that. Some of them you turn into opportunities, um, but you just have to do something. You, you can't be dampened in terms of uh, your enthusiasm to uh, continue to operate because you see um, a window. Uh, like I said, Edo fertilizer is uniquely positioned. We take our imported raw material for, from ONE. The rest of the industry is all up country. So I have a, a, an advantage in terms of uh, delivery of raw material. And then I process. And then I have a unique opportunity to send my uh, product to the northeast. Regardless of where it is, I just have to get to, to the Northeast, and the Northeast uh, would have to take my price for that. However, um, I think the, uh, the person who made the contribution says, how do we support the Edo State Government to uh, leverage on our own so uh, connections and contacts with the federal government to tell them? Um, I think the keynote speaker had mentioned an issue which is very critical. Uh, this issue of identifying economic roads or economic infrastructure that are the road tax credit uh, uh, scheme can be, listen, and I, I, I believe uh, the keynote speaker said if that is done, they would be the first to key into it in Edo. And I believe uh, to just advance the argument, the road from One going to the north part of the country passes through Edo, and it's a key economic road, as key as the uh, Port Harcourt, Lagos, or Lagos, Ibadan, Ibadan to the north. So we need to quickly uh, have the state government identify that, make the business case for it, and present it, and then have uh, uh, companies or operators who would want to take it as a road tax uh, thing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that response. It has to be a joint effort to tackle the federal government down. Tango, please, if you could look at the um, waste issue. And I yeah. do know you have something around roads and okay. how you got a tax credit. So you have very briefly, 90 seconds to yeah, address okay, both. Just to add to what is uh, just uh, mentioned, um, uh, Green Hills, right now is involved, has been involved, or the investors in Green Hills have been involved with the Doe State um, in a tax credit scheme that has enabled construction of a road from Sapele Road, about 3.5 kilometers of Sapele, I mean, of Sapele Road. Um, that's based on this tax credit scheme. So, of course, it's a good opportunity for if Dangote is also looking to leverage that, okay, to make a difference in the larger uh, scheme of things in the road infrastructure. Roads are very important, of course, to our project because we mentioned that a lot of our cassava will be coming from a waste. That's quite distant. This cassava must not be beyond two, uh, 48 hours when it gets to the plant, otherwise it will begin to generate. So the roads are very important to us. What we're also looking at doing is also to mitigate, at the moment, from the outset, as quickly as possible, the effects of the road. And that helps support the Edo State program. It doesn't affect the viability of the businesses or the investment in the state by looking into how we can dry the cassava instead. 
from the sources. We can have dry cassava chips instead of wet cassava. It will reduce the weight, reduce haulage, reduce cost, and help the sustainability of our business. Okay. So that's regarding the road. Now, on the other question had to do with um, the waste. We call it spent mash. When the cassava is milled and processed, used to, um, uh, it's fermented to produce the ethanol, there's waste, solid waste, apart from the liquid waste, which we treat with um, the effluent treatment. This solid waste is rich in protein, actually, and is a very good material for feeds. It's a good additive for feeds, marine feeds, poultry feeds, piggeries, and so on and so forth. So that's what we intend to do with this. We're also uh, looking to involve community players, small businesses, in being able to distribute and carry this product to sell for that. It becomes part of the value chain, okay? And a, a, a waste product coming out of the plant contributing to the livelihood of other players, uh, other investors in the community. Thank you. And I think the challenge was to change the entire ecosystem in the state. Exactly. So extend it beyond your company, even to the smallholder farmers. Precisely. So, Uncle Mike, the board, how do you convince boards to bring in money, you know, looking at uh, government and the exchanges, the fact that the baton has to be passed? Thank you very much. I think for most investors, um, what's attract them to a location is consistency of government policy. And uh, over the seven years, we've seen uh, consistent government policies actually putting processes and structures in place to break the, the regular bureaucratic bottlenecks that, 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 that delayed investments, because those frustrations and what the governor has, what the present administration have done, they've kind of created a level playing field. And that has made us very, very comfortable in, um, in um, forging ahead in doing business in this environment. So the institutional, the institutional structures, uh, the government has uh, set up, especially the, the investment office, where you can, you have people, if you have challenges, of whatever you want to do, you can talk to them, and they can help you talk to a one-stop where you can talk to uh, various government departments and all the challenges that have, and that has made us, uh, made us very, very comfortable in uh, doing business here. Thank you. So the public service is the key. Empower and institutionalize yeah. um, processes yes, right. and capacity in the public service, and then continuity is possible. Finally, let's go to Kazim, CSR. Uh, make me talk about something that IHS doesn't like to talk about. We're very uh, publicity shy on, uh, on CSR. Uh, but, but I'll say a few things. First, we're Africa's largest contributors to UNICEF Fund uh, and part of what we have contributed to that uh, exercise or initiative. A significant part of it has been expended in those states uh, over the past five years. I think uh, most importantly during the COVID era. But by and large, the infrastructure pitch that we have done in Edo State is 50% CSR. Um, where states has asked us for X, we provided X plus Y just to ensure that um, the project is successful and it can be done. We've also provided our infrastructure to the state for some um, specific services that I dare not talk about. On, on, on this forum, uh, which continues to help the states to manage uh, security and uh, uh, you know provide safety for people across the states. Going forward, uh, we understand the state is trying to or plans and actually is designing an initiative to connect tertiary institutions. 48 of them. We're also going to provide international connectivity beyond the fiber that we're building. We're bringing services from upstream providers so that the kids in the high schools can have access to digital knowledge uh, that are sitting outside of the shores of Nigeria or be connected to other institutions in Nigeria where they can have access to uh, the area of um, uh, facilities and knowledge-based uh, utilities. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think the challenge to stakeholders of the state is that as these businesses do better, obviously the budget for CSR will grow. So let's 
you know, support them in doing better. I don't think we can take any more questions, and I'd want a closing remarks. I'm told we don't have time for that. So I'd like to round up this panel, you know, just with a bit of a tidbit. I remember yesterday, you know, this question of sustainability came up, and I was with a group of people, and a gentleman gave a very simple answer, and no pun intended. He, simple, he simply said, God win. In other words, that God will win for Edo State. Um, so we do believe that in terms of sustainability, uh, the powers that be will have mercy on the state. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, can we put our hands together for these wonderful panelists and, of course, the moderators? I'll invite the excellencies, the current and former governors, to please join to take pictures on behalf of all of us. So you can step forward. The excellencies will join you, yes. Let me quickly welcome all service commanders, and in particular, the AIG Zone 5 Benin, Arungwa, Wanzwe, Udo, MNI. Thank you for being here. We welcome the Chief Finance Officer of First Bank, representing the Managing Director of the Bank, Dr. Adeshola Adetunta, Mr. Patrick Yamabo. Thank you so very much for being here. Renowned economists, Professor Pat Utomi, thank you also for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please appreciate these amiable panelists with your excellencies. Pictures don't lie. Thank you very much indeed. You may please resume your seats as I invite the next plenary, the moderator and the panelists walking the talk from opportunity to reality. We have a good story to tell in a door. To moderate this plenary, I'd like to invite Vivian Shabombisis, FCA, MBA. She's an accomplished professional with a distinguished career in the financial industry. She currently serves as the Chief Executive Officer of FVS Advisory Partners, a boutique consulting firm specializing in providing advisory services for businesses, investors, and debt capital market transactions. She's a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria and holds an MBA in finance from Manchester Business School, United Kingdom. She's happily married and blessed with two sons. Your hands together for her, please. On the panelists, Ore Disu. She's the director of the Institute, the new research and collection facility of the Museum of West African Arts. In this capacity, she works to support heritage initiatives and creative professionals across the sub-region and to drive a new global appreciation of African arts and material culture through archaeological research, conservation, exhibition, and outreach. She holds a degree in architecture from the University of Cambridge and a master's in urban development practice from the Development Planning Units at University College London. Your hands together for her, please. <laughs> Next, ladies and gentlemen, our own Mr. Greg Ogbaifun, the chairman, Benin Port Project Technical Committee. A committee saddled with the responsibility of birthing the legacy Benin Port Project here in Edo State. He's a chairman, board of directors of Stars Investment Company Limited, an indigenous marine logistics company rendering services in the upstream oil and gas industry to both international and local oil companies. He's a qualified marine engineer with a first class combined certificate of competency a member of the British Society of Marine Consultant and Ship Surveyor, a member of the American Society of Naval Architects and Marine Engineers, a fellow of Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Directors, and as well as a pioneer president of the Ship Owners Association of Nigeria. He's married with his wife, Victoria, and together they are blessed with eight children, two of which are already mariners. Like father, we next invite our own Isibebe Wai, 
She's an accomplished, passionate, and dedicated social entrepreneur and senior consultant in social development with more than 20 years of extensive experience in government and non-governmental organization. Partnership, entrepreneurship, community advocacy, and engagement. She's the founder of Genus Hub, a social enterprise and chairperson on the board of Genus Hub Global Initiative. She is also in the board of the Lady Mechanic Initiative. She has a BSc in microbiology from the prestigious University of Benin, a certificate in monitoring and evaluation from RIPA International in the United Kingdom, and certified in project management, policy development, advocacy from the University of Washington. Please make her welcome. And next we'll invite Edward Osayende, is a financial executive with more than 20 years of experience in finance operations supporting enterprise global infrastructure with a demonstrated history of working in the public sector, investment accounting, information technology, and the financial services industry. Is managing executive responsible for government, public, and private enterprise partnership, executive level enterprise with financial management functions, including accounting and control, financial planning analysis, line of business finance function, asset liability, management treasury, and task. He's an accomplished professional with a strong educational background. He has a master's in business administration from the University of Texas at Dallas, and a bachelor of science in accounting from the same institution. He's a member of several professional bodies. Your hands together for him, please. The moderator, you have your mic. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. His Excellency, I'll stand on all existing protocols. It's indeed a great honor and pleasure to be here this afternoon at the Alagodaro 2023 Summit. His Excellency envisaged that Edo, by 2050, will be the fastest growing state in terms of GDP, will top Nigeria in terms of GDP, and will want, be one of the top 20 economies in Africa. To achieve this vision, the current administration has undertaken a number of strategic initiatives to attract private sector investment. This private sector investment is expected to spur economic growth and create opportunities from this, in the state that the people of Edo will benefit from. Accordingly, the last seven years, we've seen an influx of investment from the private sector. So Edo State is well positioned, as we heard in the earlier panel, to take advantage of these opportunities. To highlight um, some of these significant um, investments in the pipeline, I'm honored to have with me an esteemed panel who would um, throw more light on the important um, projects that are in the pipeline. Usually, most of them are in their early stages. So um, please join me to welcome the panel. I will start our discussions this morning with Mrs. Ore Disu. Um, I would like, it would be nice if you um, please let us uh, tell the talk to us about some of the initiatives you're taking at the Institute. Um, you know, talk to us about some of the initiatives and how Edo stands to benefit from this, particularly the youth, how this is going to spur in innovation and uh, entrepreneurship in Edo State. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vivian, for the very warm introduction. Um, I must say that I am indeed very glad to be here um, and to be able to speak to some of the um, initiatives that we've been taking up um, either in Edo State. Um, we have been, I come here as a representative of the Museum of West African Art. Um, this has really been an initiative to think about how um, Benin City and more broadly Edo State can reestablish its presence as the epicenter for um, 
art and culture, um, for heritage in, the, in not just this um, in Nigeria, but across the continent. So it's really been um, thinking very carefully around how we are developing infrastructure to provide access for facilities, for research opportunities, for, um, and a, for the artists, for artisans, and for heritage practitioners across the continent. And I think this is, in, in many ways, a way of thinking about economic development that isn't focusing on the typical sectors, but is actually saying, what is the advantage um, that the state has um, when it comes to its own cultural heritage, when it comes to the vast numbers of young people, um, the in innovation that is happening and occurring on this day. So we have been invited to come in as um, a non-profit organization, an independent foundation. And already what we have started doing is developing a 15-acre um, campus that will have uh, the best-in-class research um, facilities that will enable us to do conservation management and arts management in a manner that will rival what other institutions are doing globally. Um, it will also have platforms for display, for performance, so that we can have Benin as the center for the, uh, a, a thriving hub for festivals, for events, for performances. This is really about generating a visitor experience that links back to what Benin City has been known for, for generations, for over a thousand of years. So it's reconnecting, but it's also saying that we have to do something for young people today, because if we do not, what we're going to end up um, creating is a system that is not sustainable, that doesn't create tangible benefits for people here and now. And we've started that journey already, so um, my role has been very much to think about the partnerships um, and to develop networks with institutions around the world, some of whom include Oxford University. We have a partnership with them where we're actually working to develop labs um, here in Benin City that will enable the knowledge that is being generated here to be shared and published locally. Um, they're also helping with scholarships because I think it's important that we think about skills development as part of the longer term um, sustainability of what we're doing. We are working very closely with um, practitioners um, in Europe, in the West, one of whom um, which has led us to a current, um, a current uh, focus on Venice Biennale. So this is again putting um, Benin City, putting Edo as a facilitator for, in the global art scene. I think I'll pause there mainly because I've, in the course of the conversation, um, I think we will also touch on some of the other things we're doing. But it's to say that we have started and that work was made possible largely because we had access to land and an enormous um, supportive environment that has meant that we have actually been able to host um, practitioners from across the world here in Benin City. Thank you very much. Engineer Greg Obeifo, can you talk to us about the river, Benin River project? Um, it's a very, the port is a, it was mentioned earlier on the previous panel about the significance of the port. So can you tell us what is happening, where you are with that, and how Edo State plans the citizens and businesses stand to benefit from that project? Thank you very much. Um, I'll go straight to the point. 2017, a visionary leader, my governor, invited me from Port Harcourt and said, Greg, when we were in Bendel States, we had access to the sea through the various ports of Wari, Sapele, Burutu, Koko. But when Edo State was created, we lost every access to sea and that he wants Edo State to go back 
to having access to sea. And he talked about Gelege. The journey began then. Various committees were set up to check uh, technical and commercial viability. Gelegele was no longer viable because the sea, the river going to Gelegele is no longer navigable. A new location was found, 32 nautical miles from the Atlantic Ocean, deep water on the river, journey started. What makes Lagos thick is the port. What makes Cal uh, Port Harcourt, Calabar, Worry thick, the ports. If you have a port, then your economy is bound to boom. And he insisted that we must have a port in Edo State. Initially, various options of funding were considered, but at the end of the day, we realized that Edo State does not have the kind of money you need to build ports. So we decided to go through uh, a process that can crystallize an international investor and that we were able to achieve. We appointed an international transaction advisory uh, co uh, company from Canada with offices in Nigeria. And we were able to come out with an outline business case, which we took to the federal government through the Nigerian Post Authority and the Ministry of Transportation and the ISCROC. The federal government approved the outline business case and gave a clearance certificate. So where are we now? No individual private or private company can own and operate a port. Every port in the country is owned by the federal government through Nigerian Post Authority. So Nigerian Post Authority, having approved the outline business case, was happy to work with us to go out for uh, a request for proposal for international bidders who will invest to build it. We went through that process and the company emerged. So as we speak, and as I'm here, the Nigerian Post Authority, the preferred bidder, the transaction advisor, and the state, the state government are negotiating the concession agreement on a 30-year program. Now, the journey isn't as smooth as I've just said it. But what I want to say is that even when the port has not started, benefits are beginning to crystallize. Courtesy of my committee working with NIMASA and with the approval of the state government, 10 adult children have been sent out of the country to read my time studies by the federal government, full scholarship. And these children, these children are going to be the first line of white collar officers that will operate the Benin port. Secondly, we have not signed the concession agreement. The moment the preferred bidder emerged, he has lodged with us a bank guarantee of $1 million that they are guaranteeing that we, they will definitely build the port. Thirdly, one of the stakeholders interested in the port has expressed interest in leasing 150 hectares of the land that we need, that they need for their industrial activities, and that's been valued at about 12 billion naira, which we are hoping the state can put in as equity in a PPP. Finally, all the processes, both the port itself the industrial park, which is majorly agro light, the trailer park, and the port smart city. The intention is to concession them out to private operators where Edo State, with the land, will be a partner, and that will be the model that we want it. I'd like to stop here. Now. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> now to you, Mr. Edward I.K. Osayande. You're in charge of the Benin Enterprise Park, another significant investment in the state. Yes. Please go on. Okay. Good morning, all. Permit me to start on all existing protocols. Um, the Benin Enterprise Park is a vision of Mr. Governor that was thoroughly researched, converted to 
a document that formed the deliberate reform that we see as the mega agenda. On that document, we had six thematic pillars. The Bidding Enterprise Park falls under the economic reform. Um, it is a, an ecosystem designed to grow uh, commerce, trade, create employment. The premise of the Enterprise Park at its, at its conception was how do we increase the GDP of the state? How many jobs can we create? And are all the raw materials we need on this park readily available in the state? We chose the location deliberately on Sapley Road after going around the state. Um, we have 997.71 hectares of land. To put that in perspective, one hectare of land in Benin, in Edo State, 100 by 100, is 10 plots. So you see how, many, how much land we have. It traverses about four or five communities. It's also located in the Kobaka local government, which is also where Olobo is, which is where you, we, somebody referred to as the energy hub. Um, the, what we are trying to achieve there is create, as, as government, create an ecosystem where we have done all the horizontal infrastructure. Um, that would be access roads, power, water, light, and then most importantly, security. And then look for both foreign direct investors and more importantly, local players to come in and set up small to medium scale SMEs. We have different plans for the different sectors to come in. We identified 14 sectors that we thought would be beneficial to the park, but it's a dynamic document. As we move along, we adapt because Mr. Governor does not want us to stay in one spot. We need to keep changing as the, 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 the things change. We had a slow period during the COVID period, but we are, we are bounced back. We are ready for investors to come in. We also chose that location because we are close to not only the Oceoma power plant, we're also close to the gas pipeline. So we have about six or seven and counting revenue streams. We know for a fact that whatever you're not proficient in, in business, you have source. So these revenue streams, we are talking to players in the power sector, in the gas sector, that are also interested in bringing in their, their own investment to come and provide services to the park. The last thing I want to say is, before we um, continue, the amount of employment that can come to the park, when you put in construction, a construction zone, you are looking at all the different vocational training that will come into play, um, the unskilled labor that will come in. We have, we need, in our engagements with the communities, we came up with a lot of information from them. Our CSR and everything that they, we need will come from them. You don't want to go to a place and then you say, um, I'm going to build a school here when their major problem is water. So we have been relating with the communities. We have gotten the support of the communities from their leaders all the way down to the youths. And then we are just ready for business. And I'm glad that we have captains of industry here so that they can take a look and see what, how they can come and participate with us. I would like to pause there for now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mrs. Isibebe White, the adult state youth are very aspirational. There's been significant flow of investment into the state and the state will require skilled manpower for the job opportunities that are going to be created by the investing companies. We don't want to create jobs that other, other people will come and you know, take up. So I'd like you to shed some light on how your organization is um, addressing this issue and what you've done so far. Thank you very much. I want to say I'm very, very honored to be on this panel. Um, I work for Genius Hub, and Genius Hub is a human capital development organization based in Benin City. We have to have our headquarters here. Uh, we have branches in uh, Auchi, Oromi, Plateau State, Lagos, Kano, and just recently we just launched our office in Rwanda. And our main focus is on skill development, entrepreneurship, growth, scaling the MSME, business owners, across Africa, that is actually our major focus. But, but, but for digital skills, we really pay so much attention on digital skills and TV. And then one of the strategies we use to implement all our projects is that 
we start them with uh, life skills, which is a fundamental, a foundational class for all the beneficiaries who come to our centers. So when I mean life skills, there are skills to help them navigate through lives, there are skills to make them make an informed decision, there are skills to give them clarity of purpose. So when we take them through this process, it gives them room to be themselves. It gives them room to identify their strengths, their weakness, and we help them make an informed decision at the end of the day. So what we have also done is to take them through a deep profiling, provide them psychosocial support to make them mentally ready for the training and make them develop a personal mission statement, which is like a summary of what they really want in life. Then we have professional counselors at our various centers who sit with them, provide them counseling, and help to streamline their aspiration and help them identify a skill. So we go further to, um, we have a database and we have a simple template where all skills have been listed out, the duration of the skills, the opportunities around these skill sets, plus the kind of um, uh, money they can also make beyond just the opportunity. So it gives room for them to say, this is what I really want after going through the process. So for us at Genius Hub, we are very, very excited that uh, uh, since we started, we have trained over 16,000 beneficiaries in uh, those states. And out of these 16,000, I can confidently tell you 65 of them are already employed in uh, those states. You see all these men and women with all these, all these tools, 60% of them are from our center here in those states. And we can't take the glory alone. Before the administration of God in Obaseki, I have to be honest here. We, 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 we were not, they, they, nobody wanted to do business with us. One, most of our MSME ecosystem, we did not have the right system, no structure, no uh, formalization of business were in place. Those things were not in place. And for you to really get results, for you to attract opportunities, you need to formalize your business and have policies, uh, have policy in place, then uh, 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 of, uh, um, operation of, uh, excuse me. Yes, go on. <laughs> She's very excited and passionate about this. Let me ask you what happens. Yes. Okay, I'll come back to you, to, you know. No, I'm fine. Do you want to conclude? Yeah, I'm very okay, fine. So, like I was saying, what has happened in the last few years, in the last seven years, standard of operation for MSMEs wasn't this strong the way it is right now. What we had before, people were just running their businesses, just making little money. But right now, because of a lot of training capacity building going on, it has really, really developed the MSME ecosystem. And that has generated a lot of employment. And I want to also say this. Mr. Governor has also been very, very kind. He was kind enough to identify the pain points of MSMEs, and he was able to pitch this to international community, he was able to pitch this to investors. That's why you see all of these transformation investors, international partners coming into those states. And we have also strategically positioned ourselves to actually benefit from this opportunity. Thank you. I was very, very excited about that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Governor. Back to you, Mr. Greg Ogbenifo. Um, this project is at its early stage of, you know, development, very early stage. And um, I would like you to speak to the sustainability of this project, the long-term sustainability project of the projects. What are the risks involved that can jeopardize um, this project's, you know, happening? And what needs to be done to ensure the long-term sustainability? Um, let me say very quickly that the project is not at an early stage. It's expected that the groundbreaking for this project will take place before the end of this year. And why do I say that? As soon as we finish agreeing on the concession agreement, we're developing the full business case, we're submitting that to the Federal Ministry of Transport, to the Federal Executive Council for approval. 
And once that is done, the project will be taken over by the concessionaire and they will start to run with the project. So the project is guaranteed to be. However, what we are building is not just a port terminal, we are building a port community. We had to look at all the existing ports in the country to see the challenges they are having. And we corrected all the challenges we observed in our own ports. So we have a main port, thank you. We have a rural facility. We are focusing on processing of agricultural produce so we can generate cargo, cargo throughput for the ports. So we have an agro-industrial park. We have a general service park. We all know what's happening to the Lagos ports with respect to the menace of trucks and trailers around the port community. So we have a dedicated trailer park, so you're not going to have trucks on the road. Then more importantly, we are doing something futuristic with our ports. You can see the maroon color there, that's a sport smart city we are building, a whole city, residential, with all the facilities, uh, recreation, uh, malls, offices, and things like that to service the ports. Now, this whole area is expected to eventually be uh, uh, made a free zone, a free trade zone area. That is already established. Now, sustainability usually is threatened by subsequent governments. We all know that in this country, when a government is in place, they come up with beautiful, lofty ideas as soon as they leave. Sometimes, subsequent governments, they tend to derail. So, what we have proposed is to set up a Benin Port Complex Management Agency under the offices of the uh, Governor of the State. That agency will take care of all the component members of the port community that you just saw. And that's the profile. Now, we looked at the technical aspect of the operations of some of the industrial parks, and we know that the importers of our agricultural raw material will be glad to set up industries and process those agricultural materials within the country before they export them. So we contacted one of the international port operators, the port of Antwerp, we looked at their model, and thankfully, they are discussing with us to be a technical partner to the extent that they'll be able to attract in international industrialists to come and set up industries there. And we're hoping that with that, we should be able to have these ports contribute majorly. And finally, we would like to recommend that in the life of this administration, efforts should be made to legislate the ports particularly the structure of administration to make it sustainable. Thankfully, we have the uh, executive, we have the legislative arm, and I think the judiciary is here to make that happen for the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Or right, when you answered the first question, you touched a bit on some of the industries that will be affected, that will benefit from uh, um, the project. Um, can you delve in more in terms of um, innovation, entrepreneurship from the individuals, and the long-term sustainability? How is that guaranteed? Sure. So I think when we um, consider museums um, in Africa, not a lot of us have a a visitor, um, repeated visitor experience, let's put it that way. Um, so we have had to think very carefully about how to ensure that what we are preparing for, what we're designing is not just copying and paste from what you see in Paris, in London, in New York, but is actually situated within this context here. And one of the things we've, we've seen from that is that we have to think about curating not a three hour, experience, but a three-day or five-day experience. And this is why 
in developing the concept, we've actually started with the park. We started with how, when people come into um, to visit us, where would they go? Where would they eat? Um, how, what are they? Go where are they going to sleep? Where can they buy one or two things so that they actually take this away with them? Um, what other experiences can they have in terms of performances, galleries, um, places to actually connect with local communities, with other practitioners? And in the course of doing that, we have identified various skill areas um, that we know we need to cultivate in-house, as well as other aspects of the supporting skill set that we require to enable us to function. So these are skills and services, really. And um, I won't go into too much detail, but where we see opportunities for young companies and businesses to gain from our presence ranges across the hospitality sector to um, recreation and events. So when you're thinking about um, tour management and, and guides, when you're thinking about how people make their way from the airports to our, our complex, um, and all of the other pop-up infrastructure that we'll be providing for um, rent to um, small businesses and artists and performers. And in essence, what we have seen is that by doing this, it's actually forced us to collaborate with um, other business owners, both in um, Nigeria but, all, but abroad. There are, there's a huge, huge amount of excitement for what we're doing. And I think what we don't really realize, because you know, it's always accessible to us here, is just how attractive, how important um, Benin City is in the global um, heritage landscape. When you're thinking about the, the, the historic nature of this space, the, the number of guilds, we know today there's Egon Street, you know, some people might even go further to look at the Imaket Pottery Guild, but there were not one, not two, you're talking about 20 and 30 guilds just within this vicinity here today. So we are also thinking about connecting to those hubs and also the reviving, I would say, the historic linkages to places as far as Ife, where there, was, there were technology transfers in terms of bronze casting, to across towards even as far as um, um, Ghana, where we know again there were exchanges there. So this is really about reconnecting those spaces and thinking okay. sustainably about skills development mm -hmm. across all of those service and, okay. and skill areas. Thank you very much. Mr. Osander, you have a room full of private sector investors. Uh, and, and one of the things I believe we talked about was the need for investment. So I'd like you to, in a few minutes, uh, um, speak to the need, uh, more or less sell, sell this project, you know, quickly to, to see, um, to try and attract more interest. Because long-term sustainability is important, you know, going forward, given that there's going to be a change in the administration. So I'd like you to talk to us about investments, what is needed to ensure the long-term sustainability so the state can benefit from these opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, say that for most of these projects, because we are looking for private sector input and investment, most of the time um, it ends up being a joint venture or an SPV created. The private sector is bringing funding and bringing um, expertise. Government has brought um, land ease of doing business, um, cost of feasibility studies and master plans because government, Edo State government nurtured most of these projects. So what that means is at some point, the project will now come on life and it will now be domiciled in the private sector. Private sector driven, no strain on government, no push for government funding at that point. So that means at some point in time when they have gotten to their payback period, ROI is now coming into play. They are now, now giving government their, their dividends on their investment, and then also government's IGR can get some boost from taxes and other breaks that come into it. Having said that, um, for the Bini Enterprise Park, we have a competitive advantage. The GMD of Dangote spoke about our location, our geographic location as a nodal state, talks, talks about our, uh, talks about our logistical advantage. 
which is a comparative advantage, that we must now ensure we bring efficiency, effectiveness, responsiveness, and innovation to play. What that means is when we start the, the process of trying to get investors into an enterprise park, we have to have skin in the game so that when they come in, they see we are ready to do business and they are coming in to plug and play. We are not averse to learning or changing so the dynamics of our original master plan. Our goal is to maximize getting businesses into the place, be it multinationals or small businesses. We have a mix of all of them in there. Finally, I would say there are fortunes at the bottom of the pyramid. When we look at the world today globally, the multinationals, Africa is the last frontier. Africa is not a place for cheap labor. We just need to improve our skilled labor. That's why Mr. Governor has always stressed education. Our skilled labor force has to be ready for all these people to come in. Otherwise, they will bring people from outside to come and work for us again. We will not achieve much. So those are the linkages that I just the government under Mr. Governor does not work in silence. Every project that we have has a link to another one, and that's how it goes around. We are all linked. So for me and the business enterprise back speaking in isolation, we are ready to do business. We have all the um, advantages that uh, that that will any business would require. There's power, there's water, there's light, there's security. We are close to the center. If any truck going from the north must pass through Benin to Lagos, if you are leaving Lagos, you must pass through Benin to the east or to the west, or to the um, north or the east. So we are strategically placed and ready to do business, and we are looking for, we have a policy document that, um, I use the acronym um, um, CRIME. We have communications, we have risk mitigation, we have information dissemination, we have monitoring, and then we continue to reevaluate our policy as a document. If we fall outside that, then we have committed a crime to the state. Thank you. I'd like to pause there. Thank you very much. Um, back to you, Isimeme. The needs are huge. Um, so I, I would like you to tell us some, what kind of support would you need or what kind of investments would you need? Because you have a lot of work to do. We're sitting in a room full of um, and people and businesses that can help. So what kind of, how, how, how can you scale up further? I know you've talked about a lot of the work that you have been done over the last, that has been done over the last seven years. What do you need to scale up further to ensure that, you know, as these projects and other investments, you know, come, you know, begin to come, come on board or begin to operate, you know, you are making your own contribution to ensure that the people of Edo, particularly the youth, are ready to take up these opportunities. Okay, thank you so much. Um, one of the areas where we need the support of everyone here, we, currently, uh, we are currently developing an app. Uh, two apps that are very important for us here. One is on logistics, because uh, for the MSME community ecosystem, one of the major problems we currently face, because uh, we have some of our M MSMEs exporting already so logistics is major so we, we we are currently developing a solution when um we we'll bring we we'll use drone to deliver products from the farm to the end users so that solution is see under development and then we also want to seek support for the uh, development of assassin's app the assassin's app one is to be able to match job matching for um, uh, skilled um, uh, youth in those state here. Another area where we also need more support is to see how we can train more people. Already, because of, um, of the support we get from Edo state government through Edo jobs and um, through a lot of uh, international partners that are already partnering with Edo state government, they've really, really invested in us in the area of uh, making us to be ready for opportunities, which is why we want to expand. The few ones we have trained already, they're already working remotely. We have very fantastic testimonies from our beneficiaries who are working remotely. Some of them are doing for a follow of $10,000, $12,000 monthly in Benin City here. And they are already 
finding that way outside Edo State. How do we sustain the beautiful work this administration has done? How do we employ more people? How do we create more jobs? So for me and uh, my team, what we want from this uh, Alaunaro Summit is to get more people to get them involved. Let's begin to invest more in people, invest more in these young people, and not just, just to train them, but to identify industries, industry um, need base. Every industry needs need, uh, a particular skill, like uh, Edina Greg, uh, the seaport, they will definitely need artisans to work with. We need to start looking at those skills gap. What do they need there? Uh, the, the, uh, our beautiful sister here also stretch more on what they also what they are already doing. So how do we invest and build more uh, skilled youths in order for them to fit into this role? We don't want um, expatriates to come here and take the job from our youth. So we need to begin to work on the mindset of our youth. There are opportunities here already. For all I've listened today, I've all I've listened to today, for me personally, I am very, very inspired. And I want to quickly say this. Uh, our business has expanded because of my first Allah Daru Summit. The people I met there, they have become leaders in my life, they have become mentors in my life, they've become advisors on our board. That's because of Allah Daru First Summit. Thank Again, you very, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, we will now go to Q&A and we'll take um, a few questions and then I'll come back to the panel and round up. Two questions, please. Do we have any questions from the audience? There's somebody at the back. Wait. Um, is there any, are there any questions? I can't see any hands from where I am sitting. Just one here. Good afternoon all. So my question is for the lady that talked about arts. She talked about infrastructure. So I'm interested in infrastructure because I'm interested in documentary because Edo State is about stories and documentary. So I want to know your plans for infrastructure because doing documentary requires you to get very, very sophisticated materials or uh, equipment, so to speak. So what are you going to do so that we can have easy access to these equipments we need to carry out documentaries, that's one. Then secondly, you've heard the stories about our artifacts and some of them be returned back to us. So what are you going to do with the man at Igun for him to be seen in UK, in the streets of UK, London, Italy, everywhere? So what thank are you, you also going to do with the guy at Thank Ekewan you very Campus? much, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Are there any other person who wishes to ask? Yes, we have one more and that's it. Sorry, we've run out of time. Thank you. Time. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Osemeke Victor. I'm the MD CEO at Do Shoe Manufacturing Company. So my question is for the industrial park. We want to see how we can develop industrial park. And uh, just like what is currently going on in Aba, you understand, we want to see how we can bring it to Edo. So what are the, how can we have a space there. And if maybe we, we, because I'm also the chairman of the shoemakers in Edo State, so what are the possibilities of us coming there? Is the space for free? Or are we going to pay to acquire specs at the industrial park? Thank Those you are very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, straight to you. Is this on? Thank you for your question. Um, I think that it's very pertinent that when we think about um, making an impact, that we are being realistic about who needs our help. And so um, 
artisans have been living and working in Benin for centuries. Um, unfortunately, if you go to some of the um, spaces now, you see that they are still producing, but they are looped out or somehow disconnected from the global arts market. And so what we've been thinking about are ways that we can actually help to reconnect that. So it's collaborating or at least commissioning works so that at the, they have a livelihood, they can actually showcase their arts. Um, but it's also linking them with um, fashion brands, with um, art markets, uh, um, just across Nigeria, but also globally. Because at the end of the day, if that one um, bronze caster is, for example, able to produce more, it means that he'll be able to train more people and will actually have more and more um, production happening here locally. And just to quickly come to your other points regarding filmmaking and the support that's required, I think a lot of people associate Lagos with being the hub for um, filmmaking. I, I think that there can be multiple centers of production and that Benin City is, has a unique advantage in that it's far more affordable for a young filmmaker and the crew and all of the staff that are involved in production, which can get quite large. So when you're thinking about a place where people can stay, we've been thinking about facilities, so um, affordable accommodation for short stem stay, but also the technologies in terms of um, both platforms and studio space as well. Thank you very much, Aaron. Edward. Thank you very much for that question. One uh, minute. Yeah. He's that can take offline, but I'll just say this. Um, anytime you say, is it going to be for free, you are setting the bar, the bar very low. There is a reason for you to have skin in the game, for you to be serious about your business. But they, if you look at our 14 sectors, leather, leather goods is part of it. And so we can take that offline and discuss. There are incentives for you to have first mover advantage coming in this early. Definitely um, working with um, the um, BEP and the uh, SIPO, we can come up with some way for you to come in there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'll just take one minute of closing remarks. And the question is, what does it mean to you to walk the talk? Okay, what, what it means for me personally, one is to be accountable, take responsibility, be original, be authentic, and match your words with action. So it's not just to talk, 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 but match your words with action, like exactly what our, our governor have done in the last seven years. Thank you very much, engineer. We are already walking the talk. Yes. <laughs> from what you saw displayed on yes. the screen. Yes. We are walking the talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Ore. For me, it is not lowering standards because if we're going to establish a global arts um, scene that is connected, we need to make sure that we have the best in class infrastructure, facilities, training opportunities, and that is what we're doing now. Thank you. Finally. Um, I mean, walking, to walk the talk is another way of saying, put your money where your mouth is. And Mr. Governor has done that consistently. All his projects, he supports them from start. Even when we don't see where he's going, he's already sending us somewhere. We have always seen that his, uh, his, uh, his inspiration is our perspiration. And we have learned to walk and find out where we're going to as we go along the way. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a round of applause to my esteemed panel. Um, our time has been reduced, so we would have to stop here. But thank you very much for throwing a lot of light on, on what is going on in Edo and what needs to be done to ensure its long-term sustainability so that the people of Edo will, will benefit from these projects at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Uh, profound thanks to you, Madam Moderator, for also walking the talk by walking within the time given. Please appreciate Mrs. Vivian Shobo for stirring this conversation. Thank you so much. A group photograph right here. 
His Excellency and also the past governors of Edo State are coming up to join in this group photograph. We'll just step forward a little bit. Yes, right here. Right here is fine. And create some space in between. His Excellency will come to the middle. His Excellencies. Thank you. Welcome, sir. All right. Yes. Please smile and say, walk the talk. Video, did you catch that? Walk the talk. We deeply appreciate you. This is still the Edo Summit 2023. The conversations continue just because we also believe in the health, health and wellness of those of us in the room. If you will stand wherever you are for the next 30 seconds, just stand up so that your blood flows right. You've been sitting for over two hours. So stand and then after about 20 seconds, whilst they return to their seats, we will all sit together. Let the legs stretch just a little. It's a good time to turn to the person sitting behind you and say hello to them. You haven't seen them in almost two hours. Your face has been faced to the front. Ask them how they're doing. Major takeaways. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please warmly applaud them again? Thank you very much. I'd like to recognize former speakers of the Adusted House of Assembly, and after which, former governors will be giving five minutes goodwill messages. And that will also include the governor of Delta State. I'd like to welcome the Right Honorable Dr. Justin Okonobo. We'd like to welcome Right Honorable Kabiru Ajoto. The Right Honorable Barrister Friday Itura, former member of the House of Reps. And of course, the Right Honorable Billy Osawaru current member House of Representatives, the Nigerian Bar Association, Benin Bar, Rotarian, Nosa Edo Saige. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. We also welcome Mr. Parton. Thank you. Can we please allow their excellencies to resume their seats. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cameraman, please back to positions. Thank you. Once His Excellency sits, the rest of us will follow. Thank you. Can we please maintain some decorum, please? Thank you. The works of our heroes past certainly will never be in vain. The Edo Refinery, the Osiomopa, the Benin River Ports, and many other laudable initiatives of Mr. Governor is an attempt to walk the talk. So please resume your seats. We are live on air. Please resume your seats. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please resume your seats. 
His Excellency is already on his seat. We are currently on air. Please, thank you. Please, please resume your seat. Thank you. I will next invite our past governor, His Excellency, the first executive governor of Edo States, the first national chairman of the APC, our retired super permanent secretary, once audience is very well established. His Excellency is waiting for us. Can we please resume our seats? Thank you. Please resume your seats. Everyone, please. Thank you. Please resume your seats. Please, please. Thank you. His Excellency is already seated. The rest of us can please sit. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please give a resounding applause for His Excellency Chief John Ewoyoma Kenneth Odigia Oyego, the first executive governor of Edo States and first national chairman of the APC. Can that applause be resounding for every man in my Ayobewo? Your Excellency, you are looking very cute. Your Excellency, our governor, and his wonderful wife, the deputy governor, and my good friend, the wife, the Speaker of the State House of Assembly, our respected Chief Judge of Edo State. At that point, I respectfully adopt all existing protocol. I am glad I was able to attend this seventh session of a do summit, allow it down. And Mr. Governor, I owe you intense appreciation for taking the fundamental decision, I don't know at what point in time, to turn your back on business as usual. From what I have seen, from what I have experienced, you think out of the box. You act out of the box. Otherwise, I don't know how anybody can have the type of free consultancy that you have. Eminent actors in the industrial world, virtually giving you free advice as to how to advance a do state. Of course, with our illustrious brother, Dr. Igodaro, as chairman of this wonderful self-sustaining group. It is always important to stress that. Self-sustaining group. We have persons who are committed to a cause. They've given their time. They've given their resources. They have given their intellect to the upliftment of a do state. I can only say thank you, Mr. Governor, and to all of you, thank you very, very much. And especially, of course, those who are running this show, Dr. Igodalo, and I think the ladies, Mrs. Alufoa. Alufoa, fantastic. May God bless you both. We have a very unique situation. Bringing together governance, bringing together active members of the private sector to 
to come and put together ideas, projects, not to talk of the interventions that they make, which nobody has told us about, at various levels to ensure that what our friends who participated in the two sessions actively participated also in the progress of a do state, what they have had to say uh, today. The uniqueness of Alago now, two, two aspects. I, for me, the greatest problem in this country is psychological, upstairs. How do we change our thinking? How do we start seeing things positively? How do we put behind us old concepts, old beliefs, old ways of doing things? That is, for me, the critical problem we are facing. And so Allah Odao has a unique role to play not only in popularizing the idea that and the, the positivity of the thinking of the average Benin man to take pride in what is happening in the state. Not only to take pride, but to dream those big dreams that the chairman spoke about and believe that those dreams are possible and exact energy, resources, intellect to make those dreams come true. That is a positive role, psychological, not the reality we've been talking today. But it is only from the psychology and the dreaming of dreams that the kind of realities that are happening in a do state will become uh, real, will come to be. So I thank you very much, Mr. Governor, like I said, for turning your back on the old ways. Today, the world is talking of artificial intelligence. Politicians and scientists have come together very recently to even decide how they can protect us who are creating artificial intelligence from the possibilities that you can have an enemy in artificial intelligence. And here in a do state, Mr. Governor, I'm glad to say, very glad to say, that you have taken the youths of a do state and you are molding them to be ready for this new world that we are going into otherwise blindfold. The kind of education I do best, I came in, we managed to stop at. Uh, one of these kiosks outside, that's a long conversation for another day. Uh, Deputy Governor's wife mentioned a village I didn't know was in Nigeria at all. I had to ask her, what country is that? And they tapped a few buttons and hey presto, right before us on the screen is the detail about the school that is there. Unfortunately, it's a very small village. One. 140 something pupils in the school, and all the details are there. And they said, we were told that, Mr. Governor, I hope we too can eventually access these details about the realities of the modernization of a do state. It is my hope that in the near future, you are preparing people for the world market. It is my prayer that in the near future, instead of our usual exports to Italy and the rest of place, the other places, we can now be exporting trains, manpower, that will stand the test of time and make us proud wherever we go to. I feel so emotional about what has happened and what I've experienced in a do state, but I will resist the temptation of going on and on. Let me just say the final thing. Our people say, the name you give a child sometimes will dictate the kind of child 
it turns out to be. So let me take a bit of credit. That when I said, when we were choosing models for Edo State, and I said Edo State is the heartbeat of Nigeria. Today, from what I have experienced, from what I have heard, I have that satisfaction. Even from what Hugo uh, Dalo said, that was a practical exemplar that this state is growing at 100, did you say 140%? May that heart continue to beat. I may beat very strongly. I thank you all. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, can we make it resounding for His Excellency, the first executive governor of Edo State, 32 years ago, may the labors of our heroes past never be in vain. Wagbiseyo. Thank you very much. I will next invite His Excellency Chief Loki Nosahai Benedio, former governor and the current captain of the class of governors of 1999. And amongst them is the sitting president and the SGF. Your hands together for him again. Mr. Ashley Godalo, you will permit me to stand on existing protocol after recognizing my brother, the governor of Edo State, and his wife. And of course, uh, Mr. Speaker, and our chief judge. But don't let me leave out the people that matters most in Edo State and in this house today, the money men, the captains of industry. I would like to commence by first thanking my friend and brother, Governor, Governor Baseki, for graciously inviting me to share in the forward-looking innovative experience of Alago Daro. Economic Summit has come to represent the quest for sustained growth and development for our state this past seven years. Thank you, Mr. Governor. I must also salute the evident sense of duty under the able leadership as we go down, and the faith of a loud cause exhibited by the team, which has worked to put this impressive event together. I guess you all deserve a hand of applause. My duty here today is to say as briefly as possible. I appreciate this rigorous visionary initiative which seeks to entrench through structured engagement a definitive economic policy framework that interconnects all the critical stakeholders in a bid to maximally boost growth and drive the overall economic evolution of our state. The significance of this year's edition of Alada Summit cannot be overstated. It is the seventh in the series. Various cultures, philosophers, religious, and belief systems ascribe varying degrees of symbolism to the number seven. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, do not fret. I do not intend to take you on a spiritual excursion into the spiritual and secular significance of the number seven. Maybe another day in another forum. The semantic field that the word Alarodao encompasses in a Do language is a pointer to the intellectual depth that must have gone into birthing this summit. The word does not only mean progress, it also connotes discovery, trailblazing, going where there's no path, 
and leaving the trail behind. This summit has come to epitomize all these manifest manifestations of the world allowed down. The very team is apt, creating shared opportunities into the future, speaks to a commitment to continuity and sustainability. This is why I particularly would like to endorse the special focus on the productive potential of the youth of our state who are the inheritors of the vision. With the multiplicity of opportunities available to them, including the exciting possibilities which artificial intelligence presents, I am confident that the future is far more brighter for Edo State. This being not just the seventh edition, but also the last in the life of Governor Adrian Abasaki administration. I fervently hope, and I challenge the Sassalese Governor and his team to ensure that the requisite institutionalization is emplaced to establish the ideas of Olao Dao Economic Summit as a major plan for the governance process in Edo State, and I'm glad it's a limited organization. This will no doubt be an assured way of ensuring continuity and entrenching structured incremental growth and development, irrespective of the complexion of subsequent administrations in the state. Continuity is the key to sustain economic development. At this point, I would like to reiterate the advice I preferred at the last Governor's Forum retreat for new and returning governors in May of this year. When you bow out, do not look back. I know that it's not easy to transit. I know that it is not easy to transit from being the number one citizen in, in the state to becoming just another ordinary citizen. There is always the temptation to want to remain in control of things after you have left office. It is a fatal mistake to let <laughs> it is a fatal mistake to let that bug bite you. It leads to avoidable conflict with your successor and creates needless tension in the system. If your successor seeks your counsel, you should be gracious enough to offer helpful advice. If he does not, let him be. <laughs> that way, you keep your self-respect, you retain his respect, and you are free to focus on your next stage of life calling. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I promise to be brief. <laughs> Therefore, I'd like to conclude now by once again thanking Governor Godwin Nogarase Obaseki for the opportunity to be part of this seminar event. Why congratulating him on his focused leadership of our state these past seven years. I wish you and your team even greater impactful successes in the remaining months of your administration. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Very warm appreciation to His Excellency, former Governor of Edo State, the one and the only Lucky Benedium. Wise words from a wise man, a sage, a leader, a father. Our deep and profound thanks to you, sir. Another round of applause will be very welcome. I'm delighted to welcome up on stage a friend of Edo State, I'm tempted to say a son of the soil, 
and maybe we'll give him one Edo name before he leaves today. Please receive with me His Excellency the Ambassador of Italy to Nigeria, Stefano De Leo, as he comes forward. Committed to all things Nigeria and Edo. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Your Excellency, the Governor, wife and allow me to say all protocols observed because there are so many important people I don't want to miss one of you. <laughs> I bring in the international dimension of this uh, forum of this summit because don't forget that Edo State has a lot of international friends and Italy is honored to be among of them. So I feel really at home when I come here and I'm not alone because I come also with my Consul General of Lagos and of our, with our Trade Commissioner because we feel that this forum and this summit needs to be honored with all our representatives here in Nigeria. Let me say that I am very much surprised. I did not listen to dreams. I listened to concrete visions and it was very much highlighted what was done in the last seven years and the successes you, you achieved in these seven years laid a foundation for future success stories. We won't be part of it. So let me say that also Rome was not built in one day, but in seven years you made a huge success and we want to partner with you in the future. This is an important thing because let me say another important thing here in Edo State, we stand where the history of Nigeria was made, but we stand also in the place where the future of this great country is shaped. So here we unite the traditions, the past, and the future, because as I heard before, we rightly have to move forward to put Edo State and the whole population in its rightful position, a first world country in a first world position. So you have all the ingredients to do this. And let me say that with the governor, with his team, we work hard together to bring very soon Italian investors to the country because I heard a lot of things that we can be done. And if I speak here as Italian ambassador, we have a special position to talk to you because we know the talent and the resilience of Edo State people because we host them in Italy. They are your sons, the sisters, they are the daughters and sons of these countries, but they became also daughters and sons of our country because they are now part of our society. And this is an important bridge. Diplomats are here to create bridges. I see the business people here. I see politicians, authorities. My job and the job of many other diplomats is to create bridges. But I see that here you have already found a very strong bridgehead on which we can build. And let me say again, we are ready to partner with you. Thank you very much. All the best for you, all the successes. And I'm really impressed what you did and what can be still done in this beautiful country, especially in the state. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Can we please give a friend of Edo another round of applause? They say we're going to give him a Benin name. So it's His Excellency Stefano De Leo Osaiki. 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 Beautiful. Can you please put your hands together for His Excellency? Why they quickly set up the stage for the Delta State Deputy Governor to come and give the message on behalf of his governor? We'd like to also let you know. That His Excellency Gordon Obasaki is already walking the talk. Just yesterday, several delegations went round for the city tour. And there's something close to a brigade command already situated down there in Okoroma. Can you applaud this wonderful visionary? The Ado Modular Refinery, we saw it eyeball to eyeball. The impact of MOU is situated there. The Green Hill Farms Ethanol Factory was also a sight to behold. The Victor Wifo Creative Hub 
is amazing. The Edo State College of Nursing Services is wonderful. The Stella Passenger Hospital is another medical destination. And you already know that the American physicians are always coming to Edo every year. And telemedicine is something they do from the various ward in our medical health centers. This governor is just amazing. The Edo Central Park is something you won't believe is in Edo. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, can I also request for additional round of applause for the secretariat building that this governor brought back to life. Las Vegas cannot compare what is there. And the night party yesterday at the rooftop was something close to America without a visa. Only our Baseki can do that. And then you know something remarkable? We have to train our workforce. Edo no longer use paper in their civil service. Fully automated. And the training is on at the John Odigia Oyego Public Service Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, may I invite His Excellency Elder Sharif Oberewori, the Executive Governor of Delta State, speaking through His Excellency, the Deputy Governor of Delta State, Sir Monday Oyeme. Can we please applaud him as he comes? Edo and Delta are brothers and sisters, formerly Bendel State. And so the spirit of Bendel State is alive again today. Your Excellency, welcome home. Your Excellency, the Executive Governor of Edo State, Dr. Godwin Obaseki, and his amiable wife, Your Excellency, Comrade Philip Schreibel, the Deputy Governor, and your wife, Your Excellencies, past governors of Edo State. Please permit me to stand on all other already established protocols. I've been sent here by my boss, the Executive Governor of Delta State, Right Honorable Elder Sheriff Francis Oborewori, who couldn't make it in person. Edo and Delta is one. Not be so. So we must ensure that anything Edo State is doing, of course, we must be present because we are one and will continue to be one. I will just speak through the remark of His Excellency, my boss, because this summit is uh, gone more than halfway, I believe, already. So most of what was there before, uh, we have witnessed it already practically, so I may not need to repeat them. His Excellency, Mr. Godwin Obaseki, Governor of Edo State, your friend, your brother, your counterpart, sends his greeting. I welcome the opportunity to join you at this summit. In the last seven years, Allah Godaro Edo Summit has offered the government and the people of Edo State a pedestrian for elevated discourses on capacity building, policy formulation and accountability, and institutional reforms to promote good governance, economic inclusivity, social cohesion, and sustainable development. It is my belief that proposals and recommendations and suggestions from previous editions 
have been instrumental in the progress of Edo State. That have been instrumental in the progress Edo State has witnessed under the remarkable stewardship of Governor Obaseki. The old adage that say failing to plan is planning to fail holds true for government as well. Every responsive and responsible government makes it a priority to periodically set forth strategies and detailed plans for human, fiscal, social, and economic development. Indeed, development planning is sine qua non, where the gap between the available resources and the demand for same is elastic. It is my earnest expectation that this summit will establish the roadmap to build critical road and transport infrastructure, drive human capital development, and engender inclusive economic growth. Propose reforms in revenue and spending. Provide the template for job and wealth creation through skill training and entrepreneurship for our teaming youth population. And support the promotion of micro, small, and medium scale enterprises through microcredit and training. Create conducive environment for public-private partnership investment and develop the agricultural value chain and agro-industries. Provide reforms for government-owned enterprises. Ensure growth and renewal of urban centers through flood control infrastructure, roads, market development, housing, and sanitation and enhance peace building, social and intercommunal harmony. I will conclude by saying that the successful implementations of the policies of any government depend largely on the efficiency and effectiveness of the civil service. It is a critical ally in the development process whose early engagement and partnership is crucial as they will ultimately be the managers or key personnel in administering the programs set out in any plan. I trust that this summit will address issues of critical interministerial and interdisciplinary coordinating machineries necessary for the success of any government. It is on this note, Your Excellencies, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that I wish you a refreshing and rewarding time at this summit. Thank you for your time and attention. May God bless Edo State. May God bless you all. Thank you. May God bless Delta State as well, our brother and sister state. We say thank you to the leadership of Delta State here, represented by His Excellency, the Deputy Governor, Mr. Monde Oyeme. Thank you so much, and our deep, warm, and brotherly thanks to His Excellency, Sharif Oboriwari, who is the Governor of Delta State. If your hands are still free, please appreciate their message of goodwill. The 27th leadership principle of Dale Carnegie says, praise every improvement, praise the slightest improvement, be hearty in your praise and lavish in your approbation. The 13-minute documentary we are about to see together will praise the improvements that Edo State has experienced over the past seven years under the leadership of our digital governor. Distinguished guests, please keep your eyes on the screens.
The Nigerian economy has experienced checkered growth since 1999, led mainly by proceeds from oil and gas. Over 90% of the sub-nationals in Nigeria are barely viable economically. They often lack the minimum infrastructure, manpower, and industrial capacity to function independently and generate wealth. Hence, they are mostly regarded as civil service states. Our past leaders made concerted efforts to tackle underdevelopment in Edo State. Enter the Governor Godwin Obasaki administration. An unprecedented structural transformation began, repositioning the state as a leading industrial haven, attracting investments across different sectors of the economy. The Alao Dao Summit has been a key driver of the reforms that has birthed this landmark economic revolution. The whole purpose and the drive behind this summit was to provide a forum where we could bring all shades of opinion, policymakers, citizens, all stakeholders together to dialogue on the pertinent issues affecting the state with a view to looking for common grounds and also solutions to those problems. Today, Edo has grown to become a major hub for manufacturing of materials for the building sector, with local and foreign companies competing for market share. Companies that have established or expanded their businesses in the building and construction sector in Edo State include Dangote Cement PLC, Time Ceramics, and Ronsheng Glass, among others. These companies produce cement, tiles, glass, roofing sheets, MDF boards, and source their raw materials from the state's rich mineral resources. In the agricultural sector, Edo State is leading a quiet revolution. Working with partners, the Edo State government has transitioned from subsistence to mechanized agriculture. Edo today has arguably the largest and most ambitious farm estate development in Africa. The governor put in a total of 70,000 hectares for cultivation under this program. This also would help to reduce the deficit that, that already exists in the sector. Thank God for the governmental drive. A lot of people are more interested in agriculture. Before the end of last year, everybody ran out of seedlings. We don't mind the cost, but every day we live to see the rest of mind that it gives you. And we are proud about it, that whatsoever we have done to date is done in a very friendly environment and they're thinking about the ecology, and that's what ESOP leads for. Another notable investor in the ESOP program, Green Hill Limited, a subsidiary of Saru Africa, has established a cassava to ethanol refinery in Benin City which will be fed with 480 tons of cassava roots, approximately 20 trailers, and produce 50,000 liters of ethanol to be used in breweries and distilleries and other sectors. The state is also taking a central position in processing of hydrocarbons by promoting policies and advancing incentives to improve the ease of doing business. As a result, Edo has attracted two functional refineries with the injection of 700 million naira into the Edo Refinery and Petrochemical Company Limited, ERPC. The company set up a 6,000 barrels per day modular refinery in Ulubu, Itobaoka local government of the state. The company's products include naphtha, low pore fuel oil, and diesel, among others. Its feedstock is sourced from the Uza oil field, which it recently placed an order of 200,000 barrels of crude for refining. Over 60,000 hectares of oil palm have been cultivated. We have two modular refinery running in Nolubu and Eboko. We have two ethanol factories ready to be commissioned. We have also one that has close to 100 megawatts of electricity being provided. And of course, this has led to the creation of more jobs for Edo people. Power is critical to driving industrial growth. This is why Governor Obasaki had signed a power purchase agreement, which paved the way for the setting up 
of Osiomo Power Company in a move that was well ahead of its time. In the last seven years, we've pushed and supported investment in the Osiomo Power Plant, which supplies power exclusively to Edo State. The retail sector in Edo State has witnessed unprecedented growth on account of the transformational policies espoused by the Governor Basaki-led administration. The sprawling Benin City Mall is one of the iconic projects that signposts the revolution in the sector. The spiraling effect of the retail business is the fact that it has encouraged local manufacturers to standardize their produce to requisite packaging and branding standards. They have been taking our product from here to UX. We are also a member of Nigerian Export Promotion Council, uh, Exporters Cluster in Edo State, where we have opportunity to send export our product from Benin to outside Nigeria. The creative industry in Edo State has also grown in leaps and bounds in the last seven years. Governor Basaki has continued to support the industry and established the Victor Waifu Creative Hub and Soundstage to serve as a rallying point for creatives to express themselves through film, photography, theatrical productions, among others. Today, Edo State can be counted among the areas where producers come in to shoot movies for Nollywood. Governor Basaki implemented a robust program to grow the state's technology sector by introducing novel initiatives to mainstream technology as a viable sector for economic diversification and youth development. It was very impressive to see how much is already going on on the ground with skills training, with interview training, you know, not just to, to find jobs better, but to be able to offer something to the job market. And I think many young people, we had the certificates supported also by Switzerland, you know, for the, uh, the photography uh, students. This is important skills uh, they will be able to use. With a keen focus on women empowerment, the First Lady of Edo State, Mrs. Betsy Obasaki, organizes the annual Betsy Obasaki Women's Football Tournament. On its second edition, the tournament received an award from the World Football Governing Body, FIFA, as a key championship promoting women's football across the globe. Similarly, the state's darling football club, Bendel Insurance, is regaining its past glory as they clinch the Nigeria FA Cup in the 2022-2023 league season. With increased support from the state government, the team also returned to continental football after 30 years, reigniting a new enthusiasm among fans. All of these achievements are anchored on the transformation of the Edo State civil and public service, as well as a revamped education sector. The civil service is the NGO of government. And like it is commonly said, the engine, if it's down, the vehicle is down. So what was this reform? First, the working environment has to be renewed. And uh, next was the training of the personnel. Today, they are all better off. This has led to improved services to Edo people. The governor has been very clear about what he intends to do and has been doing uh, in the civil and public service of Edo State. It is to take the service to a point where the service can function optimally and be able to serve as that instrument of government through which government delivers quality governance. Under the Edo Basic Education Sector Transformation Edo Best Program, public schools in Edo are now globally recognized as being a model for change, as incisive reforms have tackled learning poverty and enhanced foundational literacy and numeracy. We're able to transform the basic education system of Edo State through our Edo Best program, which today is being hailed as one of Africa's most transformative programs. So one of the greatest contributing factors to the success of the Edo Best program is the leadership, the political will, and the commitment of His Excellency Governor Gorbino Baseki. 
And you, this is seen when you see a state government that commits its own resources to driving the implementation of basic education in the state and then goes out on the back of what it's done to attract foreign investment from independent development agencies to ensure that the program is sustained and it's continued during his tenure and even well after when he's gone. The operating environment is now safer for investors as the government has invested in fortifying the state security architecture. A citywide surveillance system has been set up in Benin Metropolis with a command and control center supported by the Edo State Security Network. Governor Obasaki has also strengthened the healthcare system by revamping primary health care and establishing the Edo State Health Insurance Commission. This has spurred private investment in Edo's health sector, such as the Mary Ehaniri Mother and Child Hospital, which is boosting medical tourism. But most importantly, as an Edo woman, I'm so proud. I'm so proud what this has done. And most importantly, to have a governor who's keen and whose interest is to make sure that Edo is great again, to make sure that the Edo people are recognized wherever they go and we're recognized for excellence. So for me, looking back from 2017 when I came over, there were probably two flights and people wondering what I'm doing in Edo to now, people struggling to come into Edo. There's an improvement. Indeed, one of the legacy projects of the Governor of Basaki led administration is the Bini Port project, which the government is developing in partnership with the federal government. Motor Angel has emerged as the preferred bidder for the development of the 300,000 TEU port facility. Edo State, under the governor, is unarguably Nigeria's new economic frontier. The state now has a thriving local economy that positions it favorably for sustainability and economic expansion to guarantee a secured future. In just seven years, Edo has been set on a path that has altered its destiny. With all these amazing developments which we can see in Edo at the moment, the reality is that the Edo you see today is like an iceberg. What is visible now is far less than what is to emerge. Let us give honor to whom it is due. Give a standing ovation to the Honor Zoom leader. Mr. Godwin of Basaki, who has quietly changed the course of Edo's history for good and forever. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see that we have a good story to tell. Can I request us to be upstanding as we welcome His Excellency, the Alagodao Governor, the Progress Governor, His Excellency. Godwin Nogegase Obasaki, as we welcome. Thank you. Please be seated. Wow. I don't know where to start. <laughs> but let me acknowledge in this audience the presence of my three predecessors in office. As the joke goes, sometimes in the governor's forum, I have the immediate past governor of Edo State, Comrade Adam Soshomoli. <laughs> and as we joke, as a former governor of Edo State, Chief Lucky Gwinedion. <laughs> and then we say there's a one time governor <laughs> of State, Chief John Odigia Oyedun. Your Excellencies, Your Royal Highnesses, my Lords. captains of industry, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. This, first I want to thank all of you for taking time again for the seventh time to join us 
in the Alarudaro Summit, the Edo Summit. Seven years ago when we started the first Alarudaro Summit was held in a tent. Today, within seven years, we built a hall in Government House where we are hosting Alarudaro. <clears throat> Seven years ago, our keynote speaker today was this keynote speaker then. That's why we brought him back after seven years. To say, you, you gave us a charge seven years ago to go and work hard to make Edo an industrial base for production and manufacturing. Seven years after, I believe we all the, tick all the boxes of the things we said we will do. So this afternoon, I'm going to try and spend the next 20 minutes to just briefly talk about the Edo story and how we have, we believe we have started the process of creating shared opportunities which will lead us into the future. But to talk about the Edo story, the Edo story did not begin with me. The Edo story began before me, and I'm sure the Edo story will be told after I leave office. But we must, we must thank God for my predecessors in office, who started, who started the process of telling the Edo story, and it's on their backs that today I am resting to try and see what the future is going to be for us. The future is not something we enter. It is something we deliberately create. Seven years ago, we talked about the future in our first Alagodaro. In fact, this is the third time we're using the word future in our Alago Daro series. And the future we saw then, seven years after, is something we are happy that we started with. We started laying the foundation for a solid future, and then we were clear that the pathway to our future should be, stream, should be streamlined within a framework and we identified six areas that as a government, the people we were going to focus on. First was institutional reforms. And in our thinking, like, the, that was, like someone said in the documentary, for us, it, had, it was first about reforming government, ensuring that government work, because the bureaucracy, the civil and public service, at the engine of government, like the engine of a vehicle. If it's faulty, then that vehicle will not go far. So we promised that we were going to automate the processes and workflow of government, of the civil service, that we're going to motivate our public servants. We were going to train and revamp, to train them and revamp their working environment. Looking Back seven years, what have we done? We have fully automated our civil and public service. Edo State public service is now paperless. Every document we deal with today needs to be dealt with from our electronic systems. We have scanned and archived over nine million records. We have, and some of you were with us, built a world-class training center, the John Odige Oyegu Training Center, where to date we've trained over 6,000 public and civil servants and we've delivered almost 10,000 devices to our 
workers because that's the only means by which they can work. We're proud to say that our minimum wage in Edo is 40,000 Naira, which is the highest to date, but that doesn't mean much. We're looking at ways where we can increase the wages of our workers substantially beyond what it is so that they can be motivated to work. We, as government, sorry, the next slide. We, what has all of this turned to, you know, amounted to? It means that government is now working better, more efficiently, and we're seeing the results in terms of revenue um, increases. So between 2016 and 2023, the graph you're seeing shows how much uh, we have collected in terms of IGR. Next year, we are anticipating that IGR will be in excess of 70 billion Naira. What is the future for our civil service and government institutions? The future we see is that government is going to run, our government going to run as a smart government because we will use technology like AI, artificial intelligence, to run government since we already have the data to do so. You will not be able to do business or interact with us in our state if you do not have a state residency identity. That identity which is based on the national identity structure will be the basis for providing goods and services to our citizens, whether it's in vehicle registrations, death and death registrations, whatever it is, will be based on an identity which is layered on technology. We want to ensure that the public and civil service is the first choice for top talents. So we've made offers that any Edo indigent who has a first class degree from any university, any recognized university in the world, has an automatic employment in the Edo civil service. We are working hard to, and reviewing the structure to make sure that, as I said, we improve and in the future, a dual state public service will be one of the highest paid public service in the country. The second pillar we focused on last seven years ago was the economy. How do we create an economic revolution in Edo? And the way we thought about it then and stated was that we're going to attract private sector funding and private sector players into Edo State to focus on areas where we have the competitive and comparative advantages. And these areas, just like the keynote speaker pointed out, were in agriculture, production and manufacturing, and retail. Because of the advantage we have of being at the heart of the country. And thank you, uh, Chief Oyegu, for having named Edo State the heartbeat of Nigeria. We said we we're going to make invest government an enabler. Government was not going to be in the business of doing business, of competing with business, rather to stimulate and ignite business opportunities. And like I said, agriculture, manufacturing, production, and retail, and where are we today, seven years after? In the area of um, agriculture, you've heard what we've done with cassava and ethanol. We've done, we, you know, we, you've heard what we've done with oil palm. We have the largest agricultural program on the continent today with 120,000 hectares of land being made available to the private sector to cultivate oil palm. 
70,000 is already spoken for, and the next, the phase two, will commence first quarter next year. We have worked very hard with partners to open up the retail space in Edo, and hopefully before the end of the year, we'll be launching, I think, a 60, 60 shop mall, the Benin Mall, which will have a whole series of, um, of uh, facilities and amenities ranging from nightclubs to gyms to shops to shop rights and even we'll have a library. What's the future we see? The future we see will be a state where you have organized infrastructure to support the private sector production. You, you heard what we've done with the Benin Enterprise Park, which is a thousand hectare piece of property that's been demarcated, it's been with infrastructure being placed so that you, all you need to do is just come in. You, and within a few days, your CFO will be ready, you already have electricity, you already have water, you already have infrastructure in those parks. We've come, you know, we're working on the one for Benin, we've acquired land for one in the Edo Central and Edo North. We're hoping that the future is one in which governments will continue to work very, very closely with the private sector to ensure that our policies are, continu are continually adjusted and aligned to fit and suit the needs of, econ of the economy for, to drive growth. Lastly, it's all about people. It's all about talent. We, that's why we're focusing on education. We want to attract the best to help us think through every aspect of our competi competitiveness. The other area we talked about, which is, for me, the basis on, of our society, is the social welfare of our people. And six years ago, seven year, six years ago, when we met, when we started the Lao Daro, we said we were going to focus on education, that we're going to strengthen and improve quality education in Edo State, particularly at the foundational levels. We said we were going to ensure that we deliver public health care to our people. We, we were specific that we're going to create a minimum of 200,000 jobs in our first term in office, and that we were going to ensure community participation in providing security for our state. And lastly, that we're going to revitalize the sporting sector. What have we done to date? In the area of education, the story is out there. We have, since 2018, under EduBest, enrolled from 24,000 students. Today, we have about 384,000 in our EduBest system. What that means is that I can see 384,000 children in school every day. I can tell from the portal whether that teacher is in class or not, whether attendance for that child was, was recorded, and whether the teacher completed their lesson notes for that day. And what has that done? It has begun to improve the quality of um, learning outcomes for our kids, who have become very, very confident in themselves. We also, we've, you know, haven't succeeded with the basic education, uh, with the foundational education. We're now looking at education at the middle level, which is technical and secondary education. And that's where we're placing quite a lot of efforts now to upgrade our technical schools so that we can strengthen our TVET programs in partnership with the private sector. In the area of healthcare, what we, we first have launched our healthcare improvement program. We now have a, a, a health insurance commission and health insurance policies for our workers in the state. We have enrolled more than 200,000 citizens into our health insurance program. 
And our focus has been on rebuilding health at the base, which is the primary healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare system. The goal is to make sure that we have one, at least one primary healthcare center in every political ward. So the target is 192 or 230 uh, primary healthcare centers, all linked with technology. The other focus was on providing the human capacity, the personnel to run our healthcare systems. Because healthcare is about people. And we've re re rebuilt and reaccredited our School of Nursing, which is easily one of the best in the country today. And as I speak, we're rebuilding our School of Medical Health Technology, which will train the uh, human capacity we require for our basic healthcare system in the state. Please, next slide. In terms of jo uh, job creation, I you know, even if I say so, this is one area I believe we've been very, very successful thanks to the partnerships we've enjoyed from our partners, particularly GIZ um, and the, the, the French aid agency and the Swiss aid agency. To date, we've created, and directly or indirectly, over 308,000, uh, we will, there have been 308,000 beneficiaries of our uh, Edo job programs, uh, which we, and, and the way we have achieved this has been through various, uh, various programs such as job training, job placements, skill development programs, it just goes on and on. I mean, they, we've also spread out across the state by creating job centers and information centers where young people can go to to seek information about the opportunities available for them. <clears throat> we have focused on 10 key traits where we have brought in a lot of capacity and a lot of resources to train uh, young people. The, you, you heard in the documentary what we've done with the production center, and uh, these are all efforts that been put in place to help uh, you know young people gain employment in the state in the area of social welfare I'm even if I say so you will agree with me that a do has become very very safe yes we have a few pockets of incidents uh, towards our northern border but we are patrolling and taking all steps that we possibly can to make sure that we curb incidents of insecurity in the state. We have achieved this primarily because of our collaboration with the communities. The Edo State Vigilante Corps, which we introduced a few years ago, has been very, very effective working in collaboration with the national security agencies. We've also gotten support. Um, our friend from IHS did not want to elaborate, but we've gotten support in, you know, in building a command and control center uh, where every incident of crime in Edo State today is recorded. So we know of every crime that has occurred and we record and ensure that we follow through on the investigations and hopefully prosecutions. The sporting sector we, has been revitalized and we've done this basically by cooperating with the private sector. We've created 36 sporting associations and we've been amazed as to the interests our citizens have shown in helping us reorganize our sports. I want to thank all of you, particularly our corporate sponsors, who have been part and parcel of helping us reorganize various sporting associations. Uh, many of them are doing very well today. Let me single out, you know, just one of them. Uh, in the area of cricket, 
Edo State is now one of the largest cricketing states in Nigeria, thanks to Ui Akwata and PwC. We have constructed four Benin Stadia and 18 others are at various stages of construction because we need to create, build the infrastructure to support sports. What's the future we see? In the area of education, we see Edo as being the place where you can get the best education in Nigeria. Best in terms of quality, whether it's at the basic, middle, or tertiary level. We are working on the whole education plan in Edo to make sure that by the time a child is 15 years, because we have as government the responsibility to keep children in our system from the age of 6 to 15, the first nine years is the term basic education and it's supposed to be free and compulsory. And by the time a child is 15 in Edo, that child must have a vocation or a skill even before going on to other things in life. We hope to produce the most tech talent in Nigeria. We already have a partnership with Decagon, where we have now graduated the sixth cohort, giving us about 700 tech engineers, and I'm hoping that in the next five years, Edo should produce at least 10 to 15,000 tech experts in this country. We expect that Edo will be a destination for health tourism because with what we're doing with the healthcare system, we've cracked the bane of our healthcare system, which is health financing. As we grow our health insurance arrangement schemes, we'll have enough funding to support the healthcare system. Because what, whether you like it or not, today there are more private providers than public providers. So what we as government have, have done is to focus on the areas that don't, are not prof, profit, as profitable in the healthcare chain, which is primary healthcare, and then collaborate at the secondary level with the private sector. In terms of jobs, we want to focus on technology again. And so we will be working with investors to set up more tech parks where young people can live, work, and play, and provide solutions to you know, technology. In the area of sports, we see Edo coming back to its glory days of Samuel Obamudia, where we will be the location for top African sports talent. And in the area of security, we've already laid a basis. We, it's only a question of time. In this country, we'll have to implement state policing and local government policing. So the future we see is a state that needs to now plan to have its own police governance arrangement aligned with whatever the federal government is doing. In the area of infrastructure, so much has been said about infrastructure, but the four things we are focused on is ensuring that there's a master plan so that there is something to guide future governments when they come in as to what needs to be done in which area. But we want to make sure that we introduce more technology into the design of our infrastructure projects. Electricity, key, we've already started, and we believe that with what we have done to date, and the most important being the ability to create our own internal electricity market will see us undertake more generation and distribution initiatives in Edo State. And then construction of internal roads. We, in the area of infrastructure, like I said, we've done, we, the focus is digital infrastructure and you had the presentation from IHS, where today we have almost 2,000 kilometers of fiber optic infrastructure in cutting across all the 18 local governments in Edo. We want to continue to look for partners. We already have a, our own tier three data center in government house 
We have an investor that has a tier four data center somewhere in Oriomo, and we, we're hoping that we can attract more investors to build data centers in Edo. In the area of power, so much has been said, and uh, we want to get the powers to homes. And, and so we now have an electricity commission that now has the authority to establish uh, electricity markets in Edo State. In the area of transport and logistics, we have set up the Edo State Transportation Agent Authority and reversed the thinking because up till now in Nigeria, you first create the roads before you think about transport. Whereas everywhere else, it's the transport authority that determines and thinks through how you want to move people. It is when you have determined how you want to move people, you want to move your citizens, you want to move, transport them around before you begin to design and build the roads. So we've been able to crack that in a door where we now have a very, a veritable transport authority that will now work with the other um, bodies to ensure that we have a proper transport design for Edo. It's important for us because Edo is a transport hub, particularly Benin City. Lastly, the master plan, we are leaving behind a 30-year master plan for the transport, uh, for, for, for the entire state in terms of infrastructure. What is the future we see? First, we have to expand the transport the transportation network in the state. It does seem to have been caught off the, the railway uh, ecosystem. We need to think about how to build our own internal railway arrangement systems in, in the state. There is a huge, we have a huge risk with the transport design in the state today. The state has one transport spine, which is that Benin Auchi Road, and nothing else. No rail, nothing. And when that spine is affected and broken, economic activities in the state are almost paralyzed. So we must, for the future, do undertake a whole redesign so that you can link up, have a very intelligent transport network system connecting the states. Um, power, we are at 1,000 megawatts in Edo today. In five years, there's really no reason why we should not be at 10,000 megawatts. The area of environmental sustainability is something we cannot go run away from. Particularly with climate change, we are so susceptible, we have become so susceptible, uh, and unless we do and take very drastic and active measures and begin to restore our rainforests, we are going to begin to, we might begin to suffer major landslides as we're seeing um, crisis in terms of erosion control. Uh, well, what we have done is to establish a forestry commission to now begin to focus on reforestation. And we're expecting that we can plow back because from about five, 600,000 hectares of, of forests 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we barely have 130,000 hectares left. So unless we begin to rapidly regrow our forests, we are going to be very, very susceptible to some of the floodings and situations and I mean, flood situations we're finding ourselves today. So flood control, you know, environmental protection is key for us. And lastly, we must take advantage of the rains we have to beautify our environment. A do is supposed to be green, but when you look at it from Google Map, it looks like, you know, particularly uh, Benin City, it looks like a desert, desert. So the future we see is to come up with a very well articulated strategy for net zero to ensure that we manage our transition fuels carefully. We've started, we're doing a lot with gas, but we must do more with renewables. So I want to thank um, our friends who have begun to build you know, solar parks in uh, Edo State and assure you that we will cooperate with you and we'll patronize you. Let me now talk about the last issue 
of the last pillar, which is the gem of Edo, our arts and culture. And like our keynote speaker pointed out, those two leads, we can use those two to drive tourism. And what we have done, or what, the way we thought about Edo seven years ago, is to make Edo the premier destination for, for cultural and ecotourism, to commercialize our cultural assets, and to develop a market for our culture. What we have achieved to date is that we have a very, very clear master plan on how to develop tourism and our cult using culture as a driver. We have invested in a creative hub and we have designed, working with our partners, a whole cultural district. Our emphasis is to support music production, film, fashion, and design. The strategy is, whereas Lagos is the market facing the world, you know, the market that faces the world, Edo will be the back office where a lot of the creation and a lot of the production will occur. The, we are redesigning Benin City, the center of the city. We, Anagoga, part of the redesign coming out of the transport master plan, we, I mean, transport studies we've done, is to remove the roundabout in the city center. It never was there. It was always a king square. But, there was a transportation study that was done early in the 70s which introduced that roundabout. But we are removing that and we are now creating, uh, we're now ensuring that we redirect traffic and the city center extending to Exoti Street will now be part of a cultural district. That will give us about 13 acres of land in the city center which we expect to now have the following features. It will have, it already has a national museum. We're hoping we'll have the Benin Royal Museum, looking at the palace. We'll have the Museum of West African Arts, MOA, which, whose designs are already completed. We'll have the Artisan's Hall. I mean, I don't have enough time to explain to you that about 400 years ago, there was an Artisan's Hall around that, that same location, which will be recreated. We'll have heritage lodges, we'll have the Obakenzwa Cultural Center. Many of you may not know, there is a European cemetery right there by, you know, so we're behind the old hospital, but we will be moving the cenotaph and having a whole new memorial, a memorial arcade there. We have also designed this whole, this cultural you know, cultural plan is very, very extensive. There are going to be open amphitheaters, there will be cafes, there will be restaurants, there will be, a, you know, an art hotel, and there will be um, art, art markets. What we expect to, to have is facilities where we can host international art exhibitions. Next year, there's we are going to be participating in the Art Olympics of the world, which is the Venice Biennale. The Nigerian government is taking a stance, and I am the commissioner for the Biennale. And the, the, we're going to be exhibiting eight Nigerian uh, artists, and that exhibition is going to end here in Benin. I could go on and on and on and on. It's late and I, it will be selfish to keep you on. But I am hoping that in the brief, uh, brief fire, chat, uh, fire chat we will have, I'll be able to explain in greater detail one or two of the projects that we are working on. But just to say in summary that over the last seven years, we have re-engineered Edo State. 
we have re-engineered a door for growth. We are lucky that we took these steps. Where we are in the country today is that we're going to go back to a redesign of the country. There is no magic. With 200 million people yearning for goods and services every day, we do not have the foreign exchange earnings to support the level of imports that we've seen over the years. So unfortunately, we will have to pay the price by, because not being able to hold back the values of our local currency. But the key mitigants to this will be anybody, any community, any state that is able to encourage production. The good news is that 70% of the foreign exchange we spend today importing materials into Nigeria, 70% of what we import, we can make in Edo State. So if government is redesigned to work with the private sector, to have more production going on here, then we will reduce the pressure on foreign exchange. Whether it's in educational services, we have, there's no reason why we're spending two to three billion dollars a year paying school fees abroad. There's no reason. Comrade and I, seven, eight, nine years ago, decided to set up a university, endow a university, and see how we can get the private sector to work with us so that you could build an excellent university. If we had things like that, affiliated to schools in Europe and America, parents would not need to send children out there. There's no reason why we spend $2 billion a year or 2 to $3 billion a year paying health care bills. There's no reason why we're spending $500 million a year importing milk and milk-based products. So we just need as a state and as a country to focus on production. And the key to ensuring that we, we, we produce to the extent we need to is first just training our people to ensuring that the educational system is right, that people have the skills because the raw materials already exist and the energy sources already exist. It is not rocket science. The last seven years has shown that it is possible and as we look into the future, I know that with what God has given us, we will make this country great again. Thank you. A resounding applause, appreciation in droves and more droves for our digital governor, a man of vision and tenacity to follow the vision through to fruition. Please, you may be seated. He's being joined right now by Mr. Nana Ude, who will be conversing with him in tow with the award-winning television presenter and producer at Channel TV, Maope, and they will be having frank talk with our governor, a little bit of hard copy, and some sunrise right here in Edo State. They are now on stage. Please welcome them with rounds of applause. Um, good afternoon, Your Excellency. It's a pleasure to have you as a special guest at the very first insight session in Alagodaro. I've been part of the Alagodaro process since 2018, and um, when I was coming this time, I said that it's time for me to take an Edo name. And, um, Thanks to my sister and the executive secretary of Alagodaro, if we because she gave me one, or Sadolo. I don't know what it means, but I know she means well. 
I, I, like I said, I wasn't at the first Alagadera in 2017, but I've taken time to watch the videos, I've read the reports, and the, you could see a clear roadmap for Edo's future, which has been sustained through the subsequent um, summits. And Your Excellency, we want to once again commend you for the agility of your imagination in initiating this summit and also to commend the tenacity of purpose of Edo people in sustaining this summit over these past years. I'm happy to be co-moderating this session with my sister, who is not only a darling of the screen, but also an Edo daughter-in-law. So, Mawe, greet your in-laws. Well, if that's a challenge, it's well taken. Please permit me to stand up and greet. Iwe Adome. Uzomo. Tuwaya. Akuyo. Wabe Wawu. And I have to salute those from Afemai, where I'm truly married to. Afema Arwe Wapo Iwokesa Wado. So, challenge we're all taking on. If I've done it right, many thanks to my brother in law. If I haven't, please blame it on my Lagos tongue. Because I've been told, I don't know be Lagos. <laughs> but we, your Lagos wives, we bring you very warm greetings. And I was sure that I also heard the chair of Alagodaro say that what they plan is that Edo should rival Lagos. So mom is the word in that direction. But truly, I'm happy to be here, having grown up in neighboring Delta State, married an Edo man, and employed by the business of an Edo man in Lagos State. And truly, Edo has all it takes to achieve its dream of becoming one of the top three in terms of GDP by the year 2050. Our business this afternoon is to ask you, how far with the actualization of this dream? What are the challenges and opportunities in its way? So, Nana, no, no, sorry, Osadolo. <laughs> and I think by the, your name means uh, God has done it. Oh, wow. Just in case you're wondering. Yes, God has done it. Let's get to it. All right. Your Excellency, um, you are going into your last year as governor. You came into office not as a politician, but as an investment banker. And um, you have initiated bold reforms, which we have listened to all through today, and we'll probably deep dive into them during this session. But I would like for us to give you a few minutes to reflect on your tenure and to walk us through your journey of reforms, take us into the mind of a reformer in government, and very importantly, your experience as a technocrat in political office. Just a few minutes. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, thank you, Mukwe and Anna. Um, I think one thing that all of us in this room and out of this room are always concerned about is the future of our, of our country. Why are we not optimizing our potential? And for those of us who've gone into politics, when we are conversing for power, what we normally say is Yes, identify the challenges and make the promises that when we get into office, we'll use the opportunity of the office to reverse the situation of this country, or we, that we found ourselves as a country and as a people. So for any, you know, reformer, for any leader, you want to, once you make that commitment and you have the privilege and opportunity of having power, you know, you know your, your, your nights, you know, what, what should keep you awake at night will be the 
to, to visualize and envision how to make these promises, use your hopes, become a reality. What must you do to move your people from where they are to where you expect them to be? And fortunately, in Nigeria, the issues are not too complex. It's one of a leader being very clear as to what the purpose is. So always ask yourself a question. What's the purpose? What do I want to achieve? From us, when, we, when I came into office in Edo, the issue was, why was there so much poverty? Why did we have only one flight coming into the state? Why were they describing and have accepted that Edo is a civil service state? It, you can't, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you can't, have what, you can't have a civil service state because the civil service exists for a purpose. It's to help the citizens be productive. So as I sat back to reflect, I just thought, wow, okay, there are certain things that needed to be done. First is to get those who the Constitution have given the responsibility to help and the responsibility and the authority to help move things forward. And these are basically the political class, the fellow politicians, and the civil servants. Once you get the engine of government right, you can make the right policies, then people will just do what they need to know how to do best. And that's what we've done over the last seven years. Just given more, um, you, given more using the instruments of government to enable the citizens undertake their economic activities or their social activities in a manner that is a lot more rewarding and a lot more efficient. If I may follow up on that, uh, Your Excellency, um, which of your reforms was the most difficult to implement and why do you consider it so? I think the, first, the most difficult was the reform of the educational sector. Um, first, it was the first reform, I mean, first major push. Uh, you don't forget, or you may not know this, that over time, there became a very incestuous relationship between elections and primary, you know, primary education. You know, I think it was from FEDECO, where teachers were used as returning officers and electoral officers. After that period, you found out that politicians then took an interest on who the teacher was. Not just because you wanted that teacher to teach better, but because we expected that those teacher, the teacher will assist in an election. And so over time, all sorts of people were being hired as teachers because people wanted to have enough control of that process. And unwittingly, the quality of people who got in the teaching service just got poorer and poorer. So the bane of our education system, particularly the basic education system, was you had a crop of people who you, don't, you, know, you couldn't, they were not trained, they were not properly screened or qualified to be in the classrooms. And that's you see in many states in the country today. And we were not different. So getting rid of, or getting them to begin to work differently was now the challenge. And what we did, which was, you know, I guess looking back today was dangerous politically, but I, I guess God was with us, was I removed everybody, I posted everybody out of Subeb. Posted everybody out of Subeb. I got, you know, Dr. Joan of Yahweh to now go into that agency and started recruiting afresh. The, but I must be, you know, show appreciation to the unions. You would have expected that they would have reacted grossly, but they didn't. They just watched us and, you know, the, the rest is a story for another day. So the reform of the education system was the most difficult. It's still, we still have challenges, it's not over, but, you know, I guess we've made significant progress. And, and we've been told, we've been told that oftentimes 
the investments in education are the ones that take the longest to show. They're usually 30-year investments. Um, I, I imagine that, you know, you, you would want some of it to be immediate because if you're also creating jobs, you want the jobs to be for the, the citizens of Edo State, the residents of Edo State, the children of Edo State. Uh, I think that takes me to, my next, to the next question, which is about youth. Edo State has a huge youth opportunity. Uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity. A youth, huge youth population. And uh, before now, the narrative around it used to be quite negative. The former governor made um, reference to exports to Italy. That was the narrative around youths um, in Edo State. And also illegal migration. That's beginning to change, thankfully. But it also means that you now have those energies concentrated here. How quickly are you able to put those energies to productive use in such a way that it begins to show in the dreams that you have for Edo State? Um, I think what we've, what we've done is a series of things, a series of activities and actions and programs. First, don't forget we had no choice. We, the, we, we've, it was a crisis, it was almost an epidemic. 2016 was the height where you had, at one point, almost 30,000 Edo young men and women in Libya trying to cross into Europe. And 30,000, you can imagine how many would have died on the way. And, and so for us, that was the alarm bell, but I guess you know, when we did the root cause study, we then found out it was largely first a breakdown of the educational system. You know, these guys were going through school, but they were not learning. Secondly, the, the, like I said, it was like a civil service state. Private investments were not encouraged, you know, and so everybody just relied on government to provide sustenance. And how much was coming out of government? So we had to think through a series of actions. First, how do you get back these kids who are out there? And when you come bring them back, how do you give them hope? Um, so, two decisions. First, let's draw a line uh, and make sure we stop producing people who we've got sent through school that have not learned. That's how, why the education reform. And then those who have come back or we've brought back, how do we reintegrate them? How do we give them a sense of belonging and give them something to do? It means you have to begin to also expand the private sector because government alone could not absorb all of them. Uh, and so the combination of these activities, you know, uh, first creating the enabling business environment, making public services to work, because one of the first things we did, for instance, was do a GIS mapping so that we had this geospatial data to ensure that we began to give land titles very, you know, quickly and easily. So one of the things you see today is quite a bit of capital has come in um, into people's hands because, you know, you have your CFO and you can walk across the counter of a bank or whatever, you know, financial institution with some collateral to raise money to do your business. And, and, if, and a lot of other, you know, in, uh, uh, incentives take power, electricity. One of the big problems with small businesses is power. So with what we've done with Osiomo, first with Azura, then with Osiomo, people are able to now, you know, undertake some production and not having to rely on government for everything. So it's a combination of first um, bringing these kids back, accepting them, retraining them, giving them skills, giving them, you know, you know uh, life skills, you know, how to manage themselves, how to manage their businesses, how to relate to people in society. It was just like re let, getting them to learn all over again what they should have learned growing up. Would you really say that it's... I did say that the narrative is changing, but would you say that the message is sinking in, that youth can be so much more in Edo State? They do not have to travel. I mean, travel should be a second option, but... Would you say that that message is really beginning to sink in? I think it is sinking in because if I compare the number of the young 
men and women I used to see on the streets just hustling, I mean, doing all sorts. Seven years ago, eight years ago, to the numbers I see today, it's gone down drastically. Um, what am I seeing them do? I'm seeing them set up, you heard Isimeme White and the Genius Hub. You have several of such, you know, NGOs, CSOs that have come up um, providing support for them. We have seven job centers across the states and many information centers. We're seeing a lot of them wake up in the morning and go into those centers to say they want to work. Um, and we also seeing the paradigm change. You're seeing young people who are in productive business or who are in the service business or the IT business begin to make money. So we're now beginning to see new role models you know, young entrepreneurs who are now providing that leadership and that, you know, mentoring. And they are not Yahoo boys. Well, <laughs> you'll find those who are into the Yahoo business. I mean, it's all part. I mean, it's, 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 it's a reality. But the bulk of them, I guess, are also looking at opportunities to do things. The number of seems to young people who are into fashion, who are into design, who are, you know, into, you know, manufacturing you know, particularly in the food-related areas, have grown significantly. A central piece of your education reforms, Your Excellency, is Edo Best. Um, I'm sure you are contending with issues of sustainability and scalability. Primarily, basic education is supposed to be within the domain of local government areas. So how are you working to ensure that the local government areas key into the Edo Best initiative in order to ensure that scalability and sustainability is achieved. The next level of reform is now at the local government levels. You heard that we've extended fiber, fiber, fiber optics to the local governments. Um, that means that the local governments also will be computerized. We'll get a lot more data, a lot more efficiency, from the way local governments work. Today, the local governments, under the arrangement, actually fund or pay the salaries of the teachers. And what we've done since the era of Governor Shomale is to make sure that their salaries are first line charge. So once, and that's why, you know, maybe that's what happens in some states, that's why they accuse state government of uh, taking local government off. It's not so, it's like when local governments come in, the first responsibility is to pay teacher salary. So that goes before you do anything. It's when you've finished paying the salaries of teachers, then you can now use the rest to do whatever else you, you know, constitutionally are supposed to. So what has happened is that they've always paid the salaries of teachers, but they've never really had the governance of the structure. They've never really you know, been responsible for ensuring that this, what they are paying for, they get value for what they are paying for. So that's the next phase, um, and that's part of the reforms within the Adobe structure. We are seeing the emergence of an entrepreneurial state, which is remodeling and redefining economic theory, wherein states are not just Governments are not just enablers for business, but actually dynamizing business investments and even creating markets. You are doing it uh, through the joint ventures you have with private sector. Thinking about the civil service reforms, how is it preparing the bureaucrats to imbibe or adopt an entrepreneurial state of mind in order to engage with the private sector? I think the first thing is to even understand what is going on within the bureaucracy. Um, over the years, one of the biggest things, or challenges of bureaucracy is like you don't know what is going on there. So the file is always missing, right? Because you can see. Today, what we have done to prepare the public service for an entrepreneurial state is to move them to a digital platform. 
So there's a lot more transparency. You can see through what is going on. I can trace a letter or a document from the time it gets into the system to when it's been, the issues have been dealt with in the system. I can do that just by opening up my computer. When was this mail received? When was this sent to this officer? When did this officer respond? What actions were taken? And how was it disposed of? And all of that trail can be done in a couple of days, not months. So with that speed of decision making, the public servant has no choice. You can't just be idle because there's a system to, that will ask what, how you have fared and what you have, how you have dealt with matters that have been assigned to you. Oftentimes, the fear around digitization is that people will lose their jobs. Things will be done faster. There will be no need for clerks, etc. And uh, usually they are the low-level officers within the uh, civil service. Did that affect um, the, will, will I say, the workforce when you were digitizing? No, no, no. no. Not in any there way. are more things to be done. We actually need more people. So it's not, yeah, you actually... So you're going to be employed? Of course we're employed. Yeah, we've employed about 6,000 to date. You see, give, you, you, the, growing the service, you need to still provide a lot. There are so many services we currently are not providing because we don't have the people. So digitizing does not mean, you know, um, shrinking the system. It just makes it a lot more efficient and, you, and gives the opportunity to do more of those things you haven't done. That's very good. Well, oftentimes, I mean, I spend a huge time asking political questions. That's what I do most times. Um, sometimes to the border on the economy, and I think that they're very closely related. It says remarkable, it's a remarkable feat that you have all the former governors um, in Edo State here today at Alagodao. Because Edo is one. <laughs> so I'm wondering, how has this been achieved? You have to understand the Edo psyche. First, we are very aspirational and proud people, very proud of who we are in our cultures. And even though it's not obvious, but we will not do anything to destroy ourselves. We're very supportive of each other, frankly. Yes, we, come, we will belong to different political parties, but underneath it all, we understand that we, as a people, as a state, we'll sit down, we reflect, we look at the country, and we'll say, okay, what are, the, what are our best options? And yeah, it's usually not as it's perceived outside. The country always misreads what happens in Edo. Well, it's been quite turbulent, you must admit. It's not been smooth sailing. Um, so I'm wondering whether it's going to be smooth sailing as we look ahead, as you wrap up, and what word would you be give, leaving for your successor? Would you be taking wholeheartedly the advice that former Governor Lucky Gwinijon gave? Definitely. It's, I think it's about building a self-sustaining system. The moment you need, you have to be there to direct things, then you know, it's, you know, you can't guarantee outcomes. Let the system run. Mistakes, you know, the system will make its own mistakes. But if the fundamentals are right, it will be self-corrected. Four billion dollars worth of investment into the state. How did you do it? What did you say to them, Your Excellency? <laughs> I just showed them the opportunities. And you haven't seen anything yet. You know, because we, we, this is not even talking about mining. We're talking about agro and agro-based and some infrastructure-based investments. We have not scratched the opportunities yet. There's so much else that can happen. You know, we have a group of investors, Asian investors in this city. And all they come with are their machines. 
All the raw material is here. So the amount of trucks that come into this city every night just bringing in raw materials, whether it be scrap metal, whether it be silicate, whether it be you know, raw wood, to just process and the amount of trucks waiting to move out products into the markets. You've seen, if you've gone through the exhibition stand, you'll see you know, quite a few of them. So, so the opportunities exist, and that's what we keep missing. 200 million people is a lot of, is a huge market. And just satisfying that market alone makes, you know, makes all the difference. The richest man in Africa today just produces cement hmm? for 200 million people. So whatever you do, as long as you're producing efficiently and you can compete with imports, you'll make money. Ledo State is, is not an island. I mean, it's in Nigeria. It's one of the 36 states of Nigeria. You've spoken about what you're doing around security. And yes, you've said that a lot of the security challenges are on the down low. You have also shared what it is that you're doing in terms of having a center where you can see what is happening with regards to security. If something happens, you're able to see it very quickly. But it didn't quite address whether you're able to respond to it very quickly. So when you talk about response mechanism, because where you're asking or when, where, where wealth is being built, bad people will want to also look there as well. So how are you assuring investors young entrepreneurs that when you're building your wealth we will also be looking out for your security not just in terms of monitoring what is happening and seeing it quickly but responding very effectively to it with police and also our justice system yes you're right we don't operate in isolation of the entire system the Key success in security in Edo State has been collaboration. Collaboration between the local policing system and the federal security agencies. Last week, I passed out a batch of 1,500 vigilantes. They were trained in the police training school. The chief of army staff, when we went, you, you know, cried out on, when we had this spate of kidnapping on the Benin Auchi Road, worked with us, gave us approvals, and we built a forward operating base for the military on that road. We've done the same thing in Sobe. So that collaboration, a very active collaboration between the security agencies and the government. So they provide that backup. Yesterday, we, I had to go and flag off Operation Steelwaters 3 for this ill tide season. And the Army for Military Formation went out and took a whole, you know, took out location in our new coral city from where, you know, just to send the signals and clean up, you know, uh, clean up the, the uh, what's it called? Uh, the, they are not militants, but some of the rascals in that area. <laughs> well, <laughs> in terms of internal security, I mean, that security on the highway, security around, you know, which borders around neighboring states, internal security, local response systems, are you working on that as well? Oh, yes, that works. I mean, the, 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 the network we have in Edo, whether it's you know, with neighborhoods, markets, schools, don't forget, there was a traditional security system here before the coming of the white man. And so our, even the traditional authorities have a security structure built in. It was just, you know, for us, we just needed to activate and, you know, link that structure with the state structure and the state system so they can respond and they do respond once there's an incident okay um your excellency we have a lot of 
opinion leaders and business leaders in this hall. And they've been hearing a lot from you today. We will soon open it up for Q&A, but before we invite the audience to ask you questions, I would like for you to maybe ask the audience one or two questions, because this is the conversation. <sighs> well, I, I think for me, my term ends about the same time next year, right? I think on Saturday, November 11th, same time next year, I'll be handing over. You've heard what we've accomplished. You've heard our dreams for the future. What type of person do you think should take over from me in managing? What should be the qualities? <laughs> What should be the qualities and the character, key character, characteristics, seeing where we are, seeing where we are going to the person have? Okay. Who? All right. Jump question. <laughs> Sam. Thank you, Your Excellency, for all the ideas you've espoused and I think the question you've asked is as important as it is as timely. Through the years, you've shown unparalleled leadership. You've shown an unprecedented quality of thought. You've shown an unmatched ability to carry people along. And Going forward, we will require a gentleman to take us from where you stopped and to take us forward. And that person would have to expose the same qualities you've shown. He has to be someone who is committed to the growth of Edo State, someone who is competent enough to build on the foundation you've laid, someone who has the composure of a leader, Someone who has the intelligence to innovate and invent, just like you've done. And there's no doubt that we are ready and committed to follow in your footsteps to make sure that there is sustainability and there's continuity in leadership. And we are looking up to everyone in Edo State to join hands with you as we find that individual and make sure it continues from where you've stopped. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. Um, this is a perfect segue to the Q&A. Do we have... Okay, okay. Your Excellency wants a woman to also give an answer. A woman to... The, an answer to his... Okay, there is one hand there. Oh, sorry. There's, there's, okay, you're a commissioner, right? No. We, we want someone behind. Okay, yeah, there's a woman there. There's a hand there. Oh, so sorry. We've already called her. Uh, I think I can talk. Yeah, go ahead. We, what we want, we want somebody, not a gentleman, I don't agree. At this point, we want, we want somebody a little more dogged. And the work of governance is really hectic. And we want somebody dogged, intelligent, consistent, and has passion for a good state and can continue with what our governor has done. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Q okay, there's another woman there behind. The women have it. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, over where? Down there. Please, may she stand? Stand, please. Please, can you stand? Yes, it's thank you. It's a man. You. No, it's a man. Alas. Uh oh. No, 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 no. We want a, a woman. Uh, well, Over on my left, sir. Where? My extreme left. Yes, please go there. Please go oh, there. Okay, there was one. She's already standing oh. here. All right. Yes, sir. We keep hearing he, he, he. I think what a man can do, a woman can do just the as well. Women good. have it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, um, Q&A. 
Do we have any questions from the audience? Not just, an just answer quickly, to the... No, no. Eh? Sorry. Just, just okay. quickly. Okay. Your Excellency, are you recommending anyone? Are you going to be recommending anyone to the people of Edo State? Okay. Hard copy. Okay. Frank talk. Okay. So go ahead. We, any okay. Uh, Joyce. Sir. There's someone there. The we'll gentleman just, we'll just standing? Take, yes, the gentleman standing with green. Okay. Wearing green. I hope you are asking a question, right? Please, there's a lady, a woman standing no, no. here. Is it a question or the answer to... Is it a she question? Was, she was responding to the question. No, 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 no. We just okay. want to take questions now. Thank you. Here we go. Yeah. Thank you. I want to appreciate this privilege. My name is Eric Odalume. In appreciation the governor, I would have loved to answer that question, but since that has passed, I want to state here, Your Excellency, sir, what and how are you going to educate your the, the, the man that will be taking over from you. you know, the man or woman. Okay, whether a man or woman to continue with your legacies because we can't afford to allow somebody who is not as intelligent or as educated as you are to take over this office. Thank you very much. Thank you, One sir. One more there. Yes. Okay, the gentleman, gentleman in white there. standing? Yes. Okay. Just a moment. And that's it. Sorry? Yeah? Eh? Who, me? Yeah, we're right Sir, yeah. your name and very straight to your question. Sorry? I would like to... Say good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon to our elders. All right, let me go straight. Let me go straight. Let me go straight. Uh, firstly, I would like to. My name is Prince Cole. Prince Cole. Yes, I'm a pharmacist and I'm also a music um, artist. I make music in Edo language and English. So, yeah, my please, question. Your question, please. Yes, yeah. yes. So, Mr. Governor, you spoke about uh, the vigilante that has been established, our own local security um, organization and system. But um, I have an observation. You know, it is difficult to actually criticize you because you have done so well in a lot of sectors. But I will ask the question. Yeah. Amongst the people we've had concerns. There are a lot of Edo youths who came into the vigilante system. They have firearms. They've done well, but we are concerned about their welfare. How are they surviving? Are these people who are enlisted under salary? That's the first question. The second one, I'm coming, please, let me ask all at once. The second one, the people actually are very concerned about the things that directly affect them. I understand all you've done about digitalization, revamping the civil service and all, and I appreciate it. You've done very well. You've left a legacy for us. But you see, when it comes to the roads within Benin City, the ones that we commute, we commune with, I've seen that time after time, you keep working on them. It's not like you're not working on Whenever they go wrong, you walk on them and they get bad again. I would like to say, sir, if the current company, engineering companies you use are not reliable, I would say that you get better hands. That would do roles that would be solid so that Adobe people can stop saying the governor is not doing our roles because you have been doing it. Now, the last no, one. Sorry, yeah, please. Yeah. No, we'll I'm coming. You. The last no, no. one. Please, please, the last one. The that last one. No, please. Let's take one question from a woman, please. 
No, no, no. A woman, please. Uh, Joyce, can you please pass, pass on the microphone to a woman? Thank you, sir. Where? Sorry. If you're a woman, I, who? Okay. Over there. Over extreme here. left. Over here, yes. There are two women. Two, okay. Let it, there are two women. Uh, yes, ask. thank you, sir. But one, one question, please. Thank you. Your Excellency, sir, you have been talking about seven years since seven years, seven years. The old captains in Edo State, they know that you have been on the ground before the seven years. And we want to ask you, sir, for the past seven years plus, have you been able to groom those who work with you as apprentices or those who support you in your vision? Because there are some that we tag as angels of Obaseki. Your body language speaks a volume to them. Just as your predecessor in office also you understood your predecessor in office. Can you now vouch that you have those that are very, very key to your development? Thank you very much. Rights? Thank you very much. Um, the last question. Finally? Where? She's here. Okay, here. All right. Okay. No, that's the last one. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Um, your Excellency, sir. I would like to ride on the... Um, last question on road infrastructure. And my question will really be around the drainage system within the state. Because the sustainability of your road infrastructure is literally tied to the existence of effective drainage. So is there a plan, is there a master plan, even if it's a phased one, that maybe your administration is um, developing and implementing and hopefully could be carried on by the next um, administration, it would be very um, helpful to know, so we know what the future looks like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, thank you. Let me break down the questions into the various categories. First, roads and infrastructure. There are three things I want us to note about roads. First, the last point she made, which is the last time we had a master plan in this city and in this state was a while ago. So without a master plan, it's been difficult to build the requisite infrastructure that will last, particularly roads. I remember growing up in this town and General Obomodia embarked on a massive drainage program. But that was tied to a master plan. Governor Shomole also undertook a study that led to a drainage arrangement. So, first, so, so what we're doing now is now, you know, working on a full 30-year master plan, an infrastructure master plan on how to build roads, on how to drain our cities, you know, both at, you know, the urban level and also the regional level. The second is, which it ties to master planning, is development control. Because you find out that even when you have drainages in many places or natural drainage paths, people go and build and block them, which now creates flooding um, issues. The third is people don't realize that in the last seven years, we have built almost 1,500 kilometers of road, and most of them are still intact because they are all Etaria roads. The roads that give us a crack problem are the, unfortunate, for unfortunately, the federal roads. Don't forget that Benin City alone, you have almost 300 kilometers of federal road inside the city. When you get to Oluku Junction, from Oluku Junction to Yaro, you know it's a federal road, the only one that's a state is the one I built a uh, highway. From Apapava, Central Bank, to 
the bypass, Auchi bypass, Agro bypass, they are federal roads. You see how long they are. Um, Sapele Road, from the beginning down, it's... So all the main uh, uh, roads, arterial roads that take out traffic are not are outside the control of the state government. They have refused to hand them over. They have refused to allow... It didn't start today. Under the, the, the Governor Shomole, we had a big fight with federal government on Uboa Road. So this is... You know, so when it comes to, yeah, I'm not saying that it removes the fact that, okay, there's still more roads to be built, and we need to look at the issues with climate change, because it's still rain, you know, we still had rainfall yesterday, right? Which gives you only about four months of dry season to even work on your roads. But those are challenges that can be overcome by the different technologies you use to build your roads. But so we have, because of our location, we have a real problem with the national road networks. And I think we must be continue to push that those roads are handed over to the state. The issue of vigilantes, we, uh, these are, we're being careful that the state does not take over that structure. You find neighborhoods where the, the, the uh, residents come together, they don't have, each, no house has its regard. They pull together, they are, you know, migrants, and have one single security arrangement, right, for the neighborhood. Those people who have, they have, not, re have not registered at vigilantes are paid by those people who have hired them. Our responsibility as state is to profile them, train them, ensure what type of arms they hold, and so that we are, you know, we can understand what is going on in whichever areas they are supposed to be provided security for. So it's a continuous process. Like I said, we, to, to, we estimate that we have about 15,000 of such people. And within a six month period, we expect to have trained all of them. As we train them, we profile them, and we get their data. Um, that's that's what you're Grooming successors. I believe in the last seven years, this event was put together by, you know, a team of people who've worked with me in the last seven years. I walked into this room like every, every invitee here. So people who could organize things like this, just, I'm just taking Olao Daro as an example. Most of the successes and most of the things we've done in the state is just natural, you ascribe it to the leader. But the leader does not do it himself. He has people he's worked with. I guess what has happened is maybe the leadership style that allows these people to express themselves to their fullest. Good thing we don't lack good people in government. We don't lack, I mean, you can produce 20, 50 Godwin Obasekis overnight here, from what I've seen. They're there. It's just allowing them, be giving them vents to operate the way they, they, they want to. Unfortunately, we are prisoners of time, and um, we have to end this session. But before we close, I would like to ask Your Excellency to tell us what he would like to see as his most important legacy when his tenure comes to an end in November next year, and what do you fear the most that can derail the trajectory of progress in Edo State? when you are no longer in office as governor. Sorry, can you repeat the questions again? <laughs> what will you like to see as your most important legacy when your tenure comes to an end in November next year? And what do you fear the most that can derail the trajectory of progress in Edo State when you are no longer in office? For me, government is about people. The reason why we're here is because of you. And that's why we have emphasized education and building the human capacity and creating an orderly society. I believe that 
we have made our modest contributions, particularly emphasizing foundational learning. And now we're emphasizing skills development. And I just pray that the system continues to be resilient so that we can continue to move in that direction. Because if we continue to produce or get very qualitatively, I mean, high quality, uh, high, people who have, we, we continue to offer high quality training and education over a generation, we will get back and even exceed what we used to be. Um, I honestly, I don't see the threat to Edo is not internal. The threat to Edo is external. Well, don't forget that we're very resilient people. We've been here for centuries and built our own internal systems. And we can survive, and we've survived. Problem we've always had is external influences and interferences. So our biggest threat is Nigeria. Nigeria must work for Edo to continue to do well. And we believe it's a fine place to live it. Your Excellences, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our engagement with the governor of Edo State. But I believe that a challenge has now been thrown to us. He shared a dream with us and ran his race, giving an account of the last seven years. If Edo State is going to make it as one of the top three states by GDP in Nigeria by the year 2050, I think it's in the hands of Edo people. It's in the hands of the citizens of Edo State and all of us who are affiliated with Edo State. Will we nurture the dream or will we let it die? On this note, I say, Ladies and gentlemen, can you please give a wonderful applause to this wonderful team? May I invite, as always, past governors of Edo to please join in the group photograph. Please, we're bothering you for too long, but today, let's maximize your usage. Thank you. Our forefathers and uh, predecessors in office, they've done exceedingly very well in their own rights. And so, pictures don't lie. Pictures don't lie. And just to let you know that after this, we'll appreciate those on the board of Alagodao, and after which the comrade governor will make some remarks. The vote of thanks will be done, and the closing formalities will be observed. It's been a very wonderful time, and we'd like to thank you for your patience and your cooperation. And so, we'll, after the pictures, allow your excellencies to take their seats. And then, okay, the former governors alone, the former governors alone. Thank you, Mark, thank you, Nana. Thank you, Sadalo, thank you, Yusuf, Mrs. Ladies and gentlemen, can you put your hands together for this great man? Successive handing over among each of them. Thank you very much. The excellencies will now resume their seats. Can we have the podium, please? Can we have the podium before I invite comrade? Let's have the podium back to stage here, please. Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning, yes. Young men, please help us with the podium back here. Thank you. Cameraman, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of this summit, this document was given to you. The first ever speech 
by Mr. Governor in 2017. It was held on the 10th day of November 2017, and that was where the name came from. The theme of that was Alago Dao, progress. And this document is available for everybody. All Mr. Mr. Governor promised, he has kept a hundred percent. The document speaks for itself. Today, the West African Examination Council have released results for WAEC for 2023, and a came third. I like at this point to appreciate the team that has done this consecutively for seven years, and after which the comrade governor will be coming on the stage. Dr. Aswe Godalo, the chairman of Sterling Bank PLC, and co-founder, Bawu Ani Godalo. Can we give them applause, please? Please rise. Face your people, let them appreciate you. That's the chairman. And all the members of the board include Osarodion Oge Esquire. Can you please applaud him? Secretary of the Government of Edo States, Oluwole Yamo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, former Antony General Commissioner for Justice. Please applaud him. Mr. Emmanuel Ikazobo, former Chairman, Ecobank. Please applaud him. Great sons and daughters of Edo. Dr. Anthony Osan Sokumbawa, Esquire, the Digital Head of Service, Edo States. Mrs. Sophia Izuma Onyekpa, Principal Partner, is Law Solicitors. Please applaud. Mrs. Owe Omogiafo, President and Group CEO, Transcorp PLC. Please applaud. Mrs. Osaia Lile, CEO, Aspire Coronation Trust Foundation. Please applaud. Mrs. Onoise Onagino, Chief Operating Officer, Afrivest. Please applaud. And of course, the life wire of the board, the secretary of the board, and it is a woman in whom we are pleased with. Efueko Alufoha, aka Mama. God bless you. She's the executive secretary, allowed our economic summit. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to invite the Comrade Governor, His Excellency, Distinguished Senator Adams Aliu Oshomole, who represents Edo North Senatorial District in the National Assembly. He's used to dancing before talking. Can you give him a round of applause? Your Excellency, my brother and my friend, the governor of Edo State, Godwin Nogegase Obaseki, Your Excellency, the wife of the governor, Mrs. Betsy Obaseki, who is also a banker in her own right. Um, <clears throat> I don't know where to start, but I see the man we can call the, the father, yes? Because like the governor said, you gave us the name, the heartbeat of the nation. Uh, <laughs> Chief John Odige Oyego. I have succeeded him twice. <laughs> First as a governor, <laughs> and later as a chairman of my own party or our whole party. And then my dear friend and brother, Chief Lucky Benedio. In Edo, we've had them in small packages. We have some very tall, and we also have some a little bigger. Um, you will allow me to 
acknowledge the speaker so that he might continue to speak. And of course, uh, the secretary to a uh, state government. You will allow me to just observe all the protocols, but I, my attention was drawn to the fact that uh, our big brother is very well represented here, the C GMD of uh, Dangote Group, the deputy governor and his wife, and um, I'm not sure whether the chief judge of Edo State is here. Oh, yeah. We are more like the same club. <laughs> Let me thank you, Mr. Governor, for your very kind invitation to me to attend to this event. And I'd like to apologize for having to come late. I thought I would be able to make it yesterday because as a worker, I know the punishment for being absent and even the one for coming late. So I wanted to come yesterday, but I couldn't secure a seat. And we had some committee works in the Senate. I didn't want to be absent. So in the end, there was no opportunity. I didn't have the means to be able to make it here. Um, but I was determined to be here. First, because having had the rare privilege of presiding over the affairs of this great state, in fact, the greatest state as a governor, I have every respect, not only for the office of governor, which I had the opportunity to occupy, but even for you, the governor of Edo State. I also thought that for our people, not because I am special, but just because in the course of your remark, you acknowledge the fact that I think, I think even our sister-in-law, who seems to have mastered a dual language more than us, by the way, she make her final greetings, which I believe we accept from our daughter-in-law. Uh, yes. Um, to have all the former governors who are alive, present, particularly civilian governors elected in this hall, I think it does make a couple of statements. That is to say, we definitely belong to different political parties. But the sum total of those parties are not equal to the state of Edo. Edo is much more than that. And what that means to me is that we can politic differently, but we must never have doubt about our sheer commitment to be citizens of a state that should be the greatest in Nigeria. Um, because the language of leaders matters to followers. What defines democracy is the fact of different ideological leaning and the fact that we may have, even though we share the same destination, but the route to get there might differ. It shouldn't be a matter of war. I personally thought that the world should know that Godwin is my friend. It does not matter. And be friends does not mean we cannot differ. Be friends does not mean we cannot debate. Be friends does not mean we cannot disagree. But be friends means we treat each other with care and love and bring our followers together. So I thank you for that invitation, and I want to thank the First Lady too, uh, because as they say, in the past, maybe during Governor Oyegu's time, 
It used to be fashionable to say, behind every successful man, there is a woman. But now, I think that slogan has changed. By the side of every successful governor, there is a powerful first lady. Um, I listened very attentively, even as I came late. I did have the benefit of what my predecessors said before I came in. But I'm just happy that with all the challenges in Nigeria, I have always said that Nigeria is much more than those challenges. And you have just shared with us your stewardship and your vision. The only thing I will say, which may not excite too many people, but it's a reality, is that once you have acknowledged that your successors come from various political parties, even as we are united with that one shared conviction, very soon, while your party will be nominating its own candidate, my own party will be nominating my own candidate. And uh, why you will emphasize the one you have worked with, we will find something to amplify, to justify our own. And I know that Aswe Godaro is smiling more generously now. <laughs> but, but, you know what excites me as Your Excellency introduced most of the members of the Alago Daru is I just find that not too many of them are really strangers to me. Beginning with your good self, your Excellency, Aswe Godaro, who was out in Lagos, he told me how he had invested time, which was later not rewarded. In terms of, uh, when I say reward, don't misunderstand me, not Naira and Kobo. In terms of people try to implement, and I remember promising him that we would be different. And uh, I will not say it more than that. He knows what I mean. And then you measure Ogi. And I said, who is Ogi now? I said, he was my commissioner for works. If my memory, you know, as you age, memory can fade. <laughs> and then um, someone else was introduced as head of service. And I'm like, I think that was a guy who at B level 14, God used me to promote him to a permanent secretary or a director. Because I saw a young man working in the Ministry of Justice who takes his brief so seriously as if it was private brief. At a time when in our informal conversation we were like, should we be inviting or hiring attorney, I mean a senior rookie from outside? Or should we uh, you know, encourage the good ones in the Ministry of Justice? He was always winning cases for government. And they said, when you measure him, I'm like, okay. And then uh, you measure the one that we have lost to Lagos. We lost him completely. And uh, he came to defend me. And I said, yes, you've come to a do to defend me, but you are hooked. And I changed his name to Omowale. <laughs> and he has remained here. He's now a senior advocate. So I think that is the way the world is. But I just want people to know that, even regardless of what people might say, what we must never do as leaders is not to give the impression as though different opinion translate to war. That is why I thank you for inviting me, and I thank you for standing up, people to greet me as I came late, because when the governor is seated, nobody else is supposed to come in the should have closed the gate. So I appreciate those courtesies, and I really want you to know I do appreciate. And for all our guests who have come, this is our state, and uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. All of the things you spoke to, I'm not entitled to review them, but one thing I will say, in those days, we both agree. 
But what the people need is not the tears of leaders joining them to lament. The responsibility of the leader is to address those material conditions that has created hardship for the people. When the leader joins in lamenting, then there is no tomorrow. I'm happy that together we have sustained those visions in the area of education and several other areas. And uh, as you can see, Edo governors tend to be strong. When I see Chief Oyegu, I say, I pray that when I get to his age, I will still be as strong. And I just asked Lucky, you are still doing this? I say, yes. I say, you taught me that one. <laughs> so let me thank each and every one of you. And once again, my brother and friend, Governor Basiki, may God bless you and thank you for your very kind invitation. Thank you very much. Please appreciate the indefatigable 70-year-old man who is still as hopscotch as a 35-year-old former governor of Edo State, distinguished Senator Adams Oshomole. With his kind words of goodwill, encouragement, support, prayers, and best wishes, please applaud him once again. Thank you, sir. To offer the vote of thanks today and closing remarks, it's my privilege to welcome the man who we all know as the person who has his doors open almost 24 hours, if I dare say, for complaints, for questions, for insights. Please receive the Secretary to the Edo State Government, Mr. Osarodion Oge, Esquire. The gentleman. Welcome, sir. It's been a long day. Your Excellency, Your Excellencies, current governor, past governors, Your Excellencies, the current deputy governors of Edo and Delta, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. At our review session yesterday, our chairman told me I was going to give five minutes remarks. I said, no, Mr. Chairman, I don't need five minutes. Give me two minutes. I said, by the time they call me, everything that is needed to be heard would have been spoken. And I think I'm right. Seven years ago, I stood before you to tell you that the trust you had in us will not be betrayed. And I can confirm today by, by the reports given to you by the chairman of Alaudaro and by the governor, Gordon Basaki, if you were going to assess us, you say that we have passed. But Edo is work in progress. Edo is work in progress. We've not been able to finish everything we promised. And we still have time. And subsequent governments have a lot to do. Like I tell people, we came to Edo, Edo was a jungle. Yes. But our president, our president, our president, president, our especially comrade. Comrade was like a, a bulldozer. He took us, his food soldiers, we went into the forest. We cleared the forest. The present governor was one of us. When Comrade le left, we started preparing the ground. After preparation, we started planting. Those were the reforms you heard about. The reforms in the educational sector, the reforms in the public sector and the civil service sector, the reforms in IGRO. But the work is not completed yet. We expect that by this time next year, we would have taken these reforms further. And we expect that the incoming government 
We further deepen this reform so that truly Edo State will be a, a prosperous state. I want to thank you again for the trust you had in us. And I want to promise you again that we have not failed you so far and we will not fail you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please applaud Sarodioge Esquire one more time. A man of few words, but loaded with action. With that, we come to the end of the Edo Summit. Allow it out 2023. And after the closing formalities, we'll have some pictures, group photographs. The LSS Choral will lead us in the national anthem, and it will be followed by the Edo anthem. It is my pleasure to say thank you to Joyce Daniel, who has shared this microphone with me. The Patriot James Osaze Oriri is my name. It is my pleasure to have served today. See you again next year. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, my Lord, very distinguished guest, shall we please rise for the national anthem. And when you hear beautiful Edo in the Edo anthem, bettered by our First Lady, our Excellency Betsy Obasaki, your right hand goes first. The national anthem will be led by the LSS Choral. Nest, and we'll take it in full. We have a good story to tell. Just one stanza. Sustained for the progressive governor. Woo! Somebody shout, Alaro Daro! Daro! The group photograph is now. The Excellencies, the board, the LOC, 
and other top government functionaries and captains of industries will be taking pictures upstage. Can we please relocate this podium? Come on, man.